Welcome. Welcome, 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 everybody. I'm Richard Watts. I'm the co-director of something called the Reporting and Documentary Storytelling, which is a new program here at the University of Vermont. And one of the co-organizers of this event with Fran Stoddard and Kate Schubart, who is here somewhere. Kate, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so Fran and I are just going to say a few words about how it could be structured, how it is going to be structured today, and introduce a couple of folks, and then just jump right in. The agenda, and by the way, UVM rules masks, but when you're speaking, you can take your mask off, so, which is great. And I think while you're eating, you're welcome to take your mask off also. Um, all right, so it's really great to have so many people here. The idea of this conference is to focus on local news, what we can do to buck national trends of what is happening with local news and support and energize and help local news survive and thrive. And it's so important for so many reasons that people in this room know well, but allowing people to know what's going on in their communities, engaging citizens in their communities, and holding, holding local government officials accountable. So many of you have been doing this work for so long. It's really great to have you in this room. The impetus for this conference, apparently three, four, five, six years ago, Mike or Kate or others will know, something like this used to happen every year but it hasn't ha hadn't happened in a while. And so part of the whole reason for this is just to allow people to get together and exchange ideas and talk out loud about what's happening and what you do and how what you do can help others think about this issue of local news and how we can help it survive and thrive. And the universities, universities have a role. We have a role with our students, but also the other resources we have and space and things like that, that we need to be engaged in bringing to this issue. So because a big part of this was just to get people together, and we've designed, and Fran and I will go into the agenda in a little bit, and you should all have one. We've really tried to make it uh, lots and lots of space for everybody to engage and participate. And we will do a report at the end, and we are going to gather, collect some of the materials that come out during the day. So some kind of outcome here. So as you're here during the day, think about what are the recommendations? What are the things you think that we can do collectively to help support local news? And because it's about engaging, can we just maybe just take a minute? Initially, when we designed this conference, we were in a smaller room. We thought 30 people would be here. We probably... <laughs> We probably have over 70 or so. Um, but if we could just take a minute at the table, if you haven't already done that, just go around and say hello to your neighbors and. Okay, keep doing that all day long. Some minor logistics. There, uh, there is a guest password, which is on your table, if anyone hasn't figured that out. It's this card here that will explain how you can access the Wi-Fi. And there, we're lucky to have um, uh, a manager of the building who's just down the hall here, Adrian, 
and he can help you access the Wi-Fi if that doesn't make sense. We also are lucky to have uh, tech here all day. On the microphones, as we pass them around, is because, again, everybody's going to have something to say, we hope. Remember to turn off the mic. It's just a simple on, simple on off button. Um, bathrooms just across the fireplace there. There's an elevator, of course. Um, parking, I hope that worked out for people. We, if you didn't print out this one of these passes and you want to run and put it in your car, but on the UVM campus, it's unlikely that you would be towed. <laughs> if you're on a city street, it might be a different story. And, um, and CCTV, town meeting TV is here and they will be televising this, which is really great. So much appreciate that. Scott, um, can I just get everybody who's under 30 in this room to stand up for a minute? Everyone who's under 30, 30 and under. There is your future of journalism. Um, in, in our program, we've been lucky in, in the couple of years we've been at it, we've had maybe 100, 120 students who've done some local reporting. Five of them are in Vermont working in journalism, which is very exciting. <laughs> and speaking of students, I just want to give a special shout out to Emily Stigliani, who worked with us on building the first scholarship funded UVM Gannett summer student scholarship. Emily, as you all may know, has been the executive editor of the Free Press and is going on to be senior editor of the Sacramento Bee. Emily. <laughs> um, and, and again, I'm gonna turn this over to Fran in a second and do the more of the logistics, but I do wanna introduce one other really important person Bill Falls, uh, Noah or somebody, can you find a microphone for Bill? Oh, you got one. Um, Bill is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and has been a, don't turn it on yet, has been a huge champion of all the stuff that we try and do to engage students and uh, navigate UVM to help support all of this. So Bill, if you want to just say a word. I take my, I take my orders from Richard. So um, he, he actually runs the college, but uh, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful uh, to, to see you all. I, I also want to um, thank Richard uh, for all of his hard work in, in organizing this important conference. I also need to thank Richard and Sophia and Corey uh, for their amazing work with the Community News Service. Um, yeah. And, 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 and really acknowledge that uh, it's, it's, you know, of course, the brainchild of, of Richard and, and Corey. It really comes from a desire for the college to double down on the importance of a liberal arts education, but acknowledge that uh, we've, we've not done a great job historically here at UVM and certainly in the College of Arts and Sciences of, of doing two things. One is um, you know, giving our students real experiences that uh, link their core competencies, transferable skills, the things that we've been really good at you know, for a couple of centuries in teaching our students through liberal arts education, linking those to real experiences that they can take as springboards to careers. And, and Richard and his team have done an amazing job of building an internship program in the College of Arts and Sciences that I dare say is now the envy of the university. And it's in that context that Richard conceived of the community news service. And I'm always willing to support a brilliant idea I'm always willing to uh, hitch my wagon to Richard. Uh, and uh, the Community News Service does three critical things. Uh, from my perspective as Dean of the College, it really supports student success. It gives students, and thank you to, to all of you that have hosted these students. It really gives students amazing experience where they can bring those liberal arts skills to bear uh, in, the, in the journalism uh, sphere. 
it also supports faculty success. It also supports Richard's success. And, and I know Richard is pushing hard to, to incorporate scholarship and research uh, springboarding from the community news service. But of course, the third thing it does, which is near and dear to my heart as a, as a 23 year veteran of this uh, brilliant university, it fulfills the land grant mission, right? I mean, this is our land grant institution here in the state. And while we might think land grant is largely associated with UVM Extension, very, very important land grant mission. I believe the College of Arts and Sciences also has a critical role in fulfilling our land grant mission. And the fact that we're placing our students in the community and providing opportunities to do local journalism, as Richard said, which we are suffering from a lack of in so many ways, I think really fulfills uh, that land grant mission. So Again, you know, thanks to Richard. Thanks to everybody who helped organize this. Thank you, uh, all of you, for being here uh, and, and for supporting uh, Richard and supporting the, the community news service and, and the work that we're trying to do. I am really looking forward to the outcome of this conference. And uh, in such, Richard asked me to announce the fact that um, the university, through a variety of sources, College of Arts and Sciences, the generosity of the provost, the Center for Research in Vermont, has committed $100,000 to, uh, to advance uh, this effort in the community news service over the next three years. Um, I wish I could commit more. When more is available, I will commit more. Uh, that's a promise. Um, and, and I really think that the, the work that you'll do here today will really help steer the use of those funds to the greatest effect. So again, again, thank, thank you for supporting our students, for supporting our scholarship and, and helping us fulfill our land grant mission, so. Thank you, Bill, um, who really is a, get to know Bill if you can, just a total pleasure to work with and be involved with and how he has helped support, allow us to do some kind of crazy things here and grow in these programs. <laughs> um, a couple other people just to thank briefly, Kate and Bill Schubart, Cree Lintelak, the College of Arts and Sciences have all chipped in a little bit to help with the lunch, which will be amazing. <laughs> um, and, and the other parts of this event that we get to do. Um, so now Fran is going to help e explain the day a little bit. Okay. Whoa. Sorry. Uh, so so a huge thanks to the University of Vermont. Richard, we called him up and said, well, you know, I think it's time we all got together again. And this was maybe six weeks ago or something. <laughs> Richard said, yeah, okay, let's do it. Uh, so pretty amazing. And uh, if you got your list of the attendees um, when you walked in, uh, there are probably more over there. This is really a who's who's of journalism in Vermont, um, and we're missing a few people, but uh, people wanted people were knocking on the door to be in this room today, and it's fabulous to see you. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to Richard. Thank you to UVM and the Community News Service for making this happen. So we're together today to be together. That's a big one. Um, to learn about sustainability issues of journalism uh, in the state of Vermont, to share our wisdom, to brainstorm some solutions. Uh, we have incredible wisdom in this room, uh, and this is a very short period of time. We're not going to solve everything, but we're going we're to take a step towards that and commit to some actions to move forward, um, and I think uh, help focus where that $100,000 might go. Um, so as, as we kind of all know, you know, 1,800 local newspapers across the country have folded uh, since, what, 20, 2004. We've not suffered the news desert that has happened in many parts of the country. Uh, we are really lucky because of the hardworking and nimble and innovative people that are sitting in this room today. We're doing pretty well, um, but we've got, we're still in trouble. This is, you know, journalism is in trouble and we have to make sure that it is strong and sustainable here and we can make this scene much better. So soon you're gonna hear from a variety of um, journalists about a myriad of issues that are affecting us about what's working, what needs change, and where folks need help. We're also fortunate to have philanthropists in the room um, and uh, some, some veteran uh, journalists who, who, who are sitting here because they want to make sure that all of this work uh, moves forward. 
what we're going to do after we hear and, and really get a sense of what's going on in different areas of, of journalism from these, these folks, and we're only giving them three minutes a piece, which is just really crazy, but it'll ground us. And after each presentation, there'll be a little bit of time for clarification and discussion and, and, and a few questions. Uh, we're going to move through each topic pretty quickly. And then there's going to be a working lunch. You'll notice that there are numbers on the tables and just there is going to be a list, we'll, we'll put it back up again, about what each table will focus on. And we'll get, a, we'll get a little bit of a temperature about what that might look like. It'll be a little bit of chaos, trying to figure out where you might sit. But also know if, if the place you really wanted to sit and that problem is all filled up, your, your wisdom, your presence will be perfect at whatever table you end up at. So I'll just say that. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get into that more as, as we move ahead about how we're going to do that logistically. So it might be chaotic, but I know we're going to come out with some really very, very good um, thoughts and solutions. So I am going to move this on and get going with our speakers. Uh, and Richard is going to introduce those people. And I'm going to kind of keep a sense of time as best I can. Thanks. So amazingly, we're actually ahead of schedule. <laughs> um, so the first, and all of these were meant to be a couple of minutes of people talking, just kicking off the conversation, and anybody chimes in any way you'd like. So uh, we're going to start with um, Meg Little Riley and Rebecca Ellis. Meg is the deputy director of the center. She has been instrumental in growing these programs. She grew up in Vermont like me, but did a stint in Washington, D.C., in the White House and other places. And she'll talk a little bit about research she's doing around um, some of the fundamentals of why local news matters so much. And then Rebecca Ellis, who is the Vermont State Director for Congressman Welch, talk a little bit about what's happening in the federal funding scheme for local news. Thank you. Is this, yes, okay. Thank you, this is so exciting. This is kind of a, um, a, a fusion of all of the things that I'm very passionate about. It's very exciting to be here and to um, help pull this together. So just a few mercifully brief remarks about um, why all of this matters. And I mean like the big lofty why. Um, we don't really need to explain to the people in this room the role that a thriving free press plays at the local level, but I do think that we all take for granted the public's understanding of these things. We can forget to articulate what this matters um, to democracy and to the success of our communities and the people who live here. Vermont tends to be pretty good at this stuff, but we're not immune to the economic forces in the, um, in the rest of the country. And uh, I think it'll take an intentional campaign at the local level, just as it will at the national level, to make our case. So um, I'm just gonna like, let me just toot your horns for a moment uh, so we can keep that all in mind today. Um, local news supports civic ties and community engagement. There is just oodles of social science research on this, a sense of place, identity, uh, an awareness of what brings us all together. Many people live in Vermont because they chose to be here. They think it's a special place. These are things that local news can reinforce. Um, local news consumption is, of course, correlated with higher voter turnout, particularly at the local level. I'm talking about elections, small, small races, local elections, state, town, select board. Um, it all goes up when we have good newspapers in our town, good newspapers doing reporting on like the, the shoe leather stuff of committees and um, you know, it's the medicine that we need whether or not everybody wants it all the time. Uh, it's a bulwark against political polarization. This one like feels especially urgent in this moment, I think. Um, when local newspapers disappear and there's strong evidence um, in social science right now to suggest this, people turn to national and political heuristics, basically, to make determinations about their choices in local elections, and also their, uh, their sense of who their political opponents are. And local, national, excuse me, local news 
really can inoculate communities against those forces. Uh, and once they go, it is much harder to reintegrate those ideas and those principles back into a community. Local news improves economic outcomes for towns and taxpayers. Oversight, transparency, of course, we know it. This is like, it's the, the math is very strong on this. Our legislators work better for us when we're all keeping a close eye on them. Local news supports robust and competitive elections. When voters are engaged, they knew who the candidates are. They also have a higher standard for debate and dissent. They want to see interesting ideas debated in the public sphere. This is so incredibly important. So part of what I hope we do today is just kind of keep all these things in the back of our minds and recommit to making a collective case to consumers of news, to people who live here, to our lawmakers, that these are things that need to be invested in. Uh, I don't think that we, any of us should be shy about making these, these arguments. We're sort of in a privileged position here at UVM in that like, we don't need to, um, all, our only motivation in being here is to support all of you, to give students opportunities to see how the sausage gets made, to feel inspired, maybe to stick around in Vermont. And regardless of what any of our journalism students do here, they will all go on to be more engaged citizens. They'll be smarter, savvier news consumers. They'll have higher standards for the information they're exposed to. Um, this is all like, that to us is as important because those, that's how we also support a strong ecosystem of news. So no pressure, but the fate of democracy is on your shoulders. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rebecca Ellis. I'm the state director for Congressman Welch. And thank you for inviting me to join you today. And um, Congressman Welch is extremely concerned about the economic pressure um, on local media right now. And he strongly supports getting more financial assistance for local journalism. I don't need to explain to you, Meg just did, <laughs> about the fact that a strong democracy really depends on robust and healthy media. Democratic institutions rely on an informed electorate, and without an informed electorate, or worse, a misinformed electorate, our democracy is in peril. And Congressman Welch actually frequently makes that point when he's talking to folks. Over the past two years, the CARES Act, um, through the Paycheck Provider Program, extended a lifeline to many Vermont media groups. Um, but clearly that's not enough and isn't going to address some of the structural changes in local media. Um, Congressman Welch has co-sponsored the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, and I've been asked by Richard to use my three minutes to try to explain what this bill does. And I do want to just say at the outset that this is one attempt to address the problems that um, local media is facing right now, but I'm really looking forward to today's conversation and, and other ideas that people might have. So the Local Journalism Sustainability Act is a bipartisan bill in the House. Both Democrats and Republicans have supported it. There is a companion bill in the Senate, identical companion bill, um, but it's only been supported in the Senate by Democrats, and Senator Leahy is a co-sponsor in the Senate. The bill is a tax bill. It would create three new tax credits. One would be a subscription tax credit for consumers, buyers um, of newspapers. The second tax credit would be a compensation tax credit for local media that hires news journalists. And the third would be an advertising tax credit for small businesses that advertise in local media, including both, uh, as well, radio and TV. So I'll just briefly explain explain each of these tax credits. The first credit, which would be for consumers, is a five-year credit up to $250 annually. It would cover 80% of subscription costs um, in the first year of the tax credit and 50% in the following years. So um, to receive a $250 tax credit, a subscriber would have to spend at least $312 the first year and $500 each of the following four years. Sorry, there's a lot of numbers here, but I thought I'd run through it just to give you a sense of what it means in, in actual dollars. Um, the second credit, which would be for local media that hire local journalists, as again, it's a five-year tax credit, it's a five-year bill. Um, it would provide up to $25,000 a year per journalist in the first year and up to $15,000 per journalist in the second 
in the subsequent four years. And the credit would cover up to 50% of compensation in the first year and 30% of compensation in the subsequent four years. And the final credit um, would be for small businesses that advertise in local media. Again, it's a five-year credit. It's up to $5,000 in the first year, $2,500 in subsequent four years. Um, so the credit covers 80% of advertising costs in the first year, 50% in subsequent four years. So a small business that wants to receive the maximum credit would have to spend at least $6,250 in the first year and $5,000 in subsequent four years. I did also think that the definition of uh, a local newspaper was interesting in the bill. Um, it it's, um, defines local newspapers as print or digital media that serves the needs of a regional or local community, provides original content from primary sources, and with fewer than 750 employees. So I'm guessing that all of the media here in the room would qualify. Um, so that's my three minutes. Um, Con Congressman Welch will be fighting for this and other legislation to support local media and local journalists. Thanks. So we've heard from um, about kind of the national landscape of what's going on. We have a few minutes if people want clarifications from either Rebecca or Meg um, or something else that they want to state at this point. We'll move through these presentations fairly quickly, but we also want to give you all a chance to have comment on, on any of these speakers and what we're talking about. This is kind of introductory stuff. So maybe there isn't at this time, but I think there will be soon. Here we go. Yes, thank you. And please just say your name. Hi, I'm Scott Finn. I'm with VPR in Vermont PBS. And uh, this is for Rebecca. I'm curious if you could give us a sense with the, the buys of the Build Back Better bill, what is actually happening with the journalism, local journalism sustainability act and what do you think are the chances it could go through? Thanks. Um, well, the good news is that the bill is both in the House and the Senate. Um, also good news that it's bipartisan in the House. But as many of you have probably noticed, Congress isn't working completely well these days. So um, I would, it, it's probably not a good chance that the bill will pass this session. Um, that said, it's really important that these bills get introduced and that the ideas get socialized um, so that they can be incorporated at some point into some legislation you know, either this year or in a future session. And aren't some states uh, doing this on their own, doing tax credits uh, like this, like New I'm, York? Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but just to mention, I'm sure folks in this room know that there was a lot of money um, in the ARPA bill um, for the state and local coronavirus relief fund. So the state does have some funds at this moment that it could be putting towards these types of credits if it wanted. Thank you. Hi, it's for Rebecca also. Don't, don't sit down. <laughs> I think the tax credits, I think the tax credits are a great idea, but I wonder what um, Congressman Welch is doing about Section 230 of the FCC rules, which I think is really the seat of the problem for local newspapers. Uh, Section 230 is the, um, is for social media companies. They have no liability for the content that is published on their platforms. retorter. Great. I, I don't have this um, actually great specific answer for you right now. I know that Congressman Welch has been very concerned about the impact of social media um, and the discourse on social media on um, democracy generally and has some initiatives that he's um, planning to introduce to um, create a little more um, regulation of what happens on social media. And I think that addresses your question, but I can get back to you with some more specifics. Others, don't be shy. And by the way, you can also just, if there's something you want to say sort of in this thematic area, shout it out. My and just call on people. 
Uh, where's Tim from Vermont Business Magazine? I'm sure you have something to say. Uh, one of my uh, thoughts coming in here is about competition, and here we are in a collaborative environment, but as we know in the last generation, uh, the competition between news, news organizations has largely disappeared, and it, it, it's, not a, it's not a question, it's more just a thought of um, what that's done also to the, the general news and environment, and I'm not sure if you have any, any data on that or, or there's been any um, discussion about that, and it's sort of more globally. Either, Rebecca or Meg. Yeah. So in places where news competition goes down, the, there has been quite a bit of social science research on this, and the quality of the coverage also tends to go down. Um, the This is something that has been, you. It, it tends to, it works with apples to apples comparisons, newspapers and newspapers, but it also works with newspapers and public radio stations, um, newspapers and, and private radio stations. Uh, the, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to editorialize slightly on this. I think that the understanding there is that the public becomes less sophisticated consumers of news, essentially the demand for it tends to weaken a little bit. Um, even if one can be one, even if the surviving outlets may be more economically uh, healthy because they, at least in the near term, maybe get some of the advertising dollars, but that doesn't mean that the quality of the product tends, um, improves in any material way. So um, it, it, I, I'm going to, I'm going to look, I'm going to try to find a concrete, um, some, some more recent studies on this because I think it's a really interesting question because it speaks to the point that a rising tide really will lift everyone in this room and um, a, a sense of competition among news organizations, it really ultimately, even if in the near term may feel like pain, ultimately it really can be incredibly helpful to everybody. Any Anyone else have a uh, clarifying question, a comment. We can move on. We've got a lot of ground to cover, but um, maybe we'll we'll move on and we'll keep we'll keep these uh, everything churning churning away here. So, Richard, are you ready to to move on to the next set of speakers? Okay. So now the folks actually out there doing this work at the local level. We have somebody who drove all the way up from Brattleboro, Randy, Paul Hutt, here somewhere <laughs> from the Commons. Uh, Randy can tell us about that. Um, Lisa Loomis from the Valley is not able to be here, but Mike Donahue, who many of you know, will give a word or two about that Lisa passed on to him about some of her observations from the Valley. And Cassandra, are you here? Yes, Cassandra from the bridge. And um, Tim, are you here? Okay, Tim may walk in the, ha, okay. There he is. <laughs> and Richard, we need you to put your mic a little bit closer to your mouth, and, and that's true for everybody else. Okay. Ah, it's the mask thing. <laughs> um, Anyway, Tim Thank you. Calabro from the Randolph Herald. And by the way, I've been out and around, gathered a few papers. I don't know if anyone brought some, but if you want to see some of the work that's going on in these communities, that's there on the table. So the order we have, I think, Randy, and we'll just we'll just we'll just go in this order, okay? Randy, Tim, Cassandra, and then Mike to talk about the valley. So, Randy. Take it away. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Greetings from the banana belt. 
So the Commons was formed in 2004 as a around the kitchen table and started publishing in 2006 and became a weekly in 2010 where I entered into the story and I've been there since that date. It was founded on the idea that there shouldn't be a toll gate in front of uh, the news. That news is a public service and it is something that everyone should have access to regardless of means. So we started out with the idea that we would be a free newspaper and we'd also be a nonprofit newspaper. We were one of the, among the first in the country to adopt the model of a nonprofit newspaper, mainly because we wore out the IRS in trying to, to solicit them for the, for the uh, status. And they didn't know what to do with us, so they gave it to us. <laughs> in any event, it, the nonprofit status ensures us that there will be no hedge fund buying the commons. There is nobody that can buy the commons because nobody owns the commons. We have a we have a, a board of directors, but there is no nothing to be bought or sold. So it really can be a community resource that will live past Jeff Potter, who can't be here today and stuck me with this job of talking to you all, everyone. It's a guy nice to do that. <laughs> but it's also the idea that we can keep it going and the, introducing the, the public radio model to, to journalism. And it was a tough sell in the beginning because people thought, well, why don't you sell the, why don't you sell the paper? You know, why, why are you giving the paper for free? And then we circle back to the initial argument that uh, we, it would be more trouble than it's worth to charge for it. So a free newspaper comes, is, doesn't come, comes at a cost. Somebody's got to pay for it. So philanthropy pays for some of it. Individual donors pay for some of it. We get, we've managed to convince several hundred people to pay for their free newspaper, which is a pretty good feat. And, and since the pandemic, we had, like many of you out here, we accepted the lifeline of PPP and the uh, state grant money, and that kept us in business. But the pandemic also had an other, another interesting effect for us, and maybe for some of the other folks around here who rely on philanthropy. People suddenly realized how important a newspaper, a local newspaper was. And they dug a little deeper in their, in their wallets and, and started giving us money and supporting us. And Brattleboro is a unique place. We're far enough away that nobody wants to cover us. We're too far from Burlington. We're too far from Boston, too far from Albany, too far for, from Springfield, Massachusetts. So there's, I don't, it's been a, a, there used to be a pretty robust media ecosystem with a community radio station, a community website, uh, two commercial radio stations and a daily newspaper. But the daily newspaper, the circulation has dropped precipitously. I don't want to blame because I left 10, 10 years ago because I worked there. But um, the, both the, the radio stations don't do newscasts anymore. They used to. The, it's become a model that the nonprofit model has become the model that will keep a newspaper going, we think. It's, we put the non and nonprofit many years. I'm happy to say we're a little closer now to, to, uh, paying, or to paying for our pat, paying off previous debts and getting a financial footing, but the cost has been, Jeff and I are the only full-time people in the newsroom and we rely on community contra uh, contributions from freelancers. We have a couple of freelancers we have. Um, we've taken full advantage of the offer of Vermont Digger to share their content with local newspapers. And uh, it's been, there's been a stone soup aspect of the newspaper. But for the most part, we're surviving with a model that we don't have to explain anymore because people get it, a newspaper that can't be bought. Tim. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Tim Calibro from the uh, Herald down in Randolph, the White River Valley Herald. Um, I started there as an intern when I was in high school as a photographer and I never really escaped from that and I am still there today. Um, we're sort of the, the opposite of the commons and the, the Herald is a, is a for-profit paper that was started in 1874 um, and so far still kicking. Um, one of the, 
I, I, I'm very interested today in hearing how everyone feels about the kind of the, the people aspect of, um, of local journalism. And one of the things that um, we do at the Herald and that we've had some success with is working with, um, with interns, you know, forever, including myself. And um, I think that ultimately that's going to be a, a key point in keeping, keeping us staffed, but also in keeping people interested in reading the news when there are about a billion other things that they could be doing with their time including watching the best TV that we've ever had in history. So, you know, we, we've got some stiff competition. Um, so we're gonna get people while they're young and clue them into how vitally important this all is. And Mike Donahue, jump up and talk. To, oh, you need a mic maybe, you got one. Speakers should know that you might see me coming around and doing this TV thing after three minutes, and that's time to, to wrap up. Go, Mike. Thank you. So I'm Mike Donahue. Uh, Lisa Loomis uh, sends her regrets. Uh, she has come down sick, so uh, she asked me to read some of the comments that she had prepared uh, about the Valley Reporter, which is down in the Waitsfield-Warren area. which uh, has been an operation for over 50 years. So number one, we record the history of the people, politics, and events of our community. We scrupulously monitor, question, and challenge our elected and appointed officials, keeping them open, honest, and transparent with our community, but also import providing important context for their actions. For example, the town of Warren has been working on rewriting its land use regulations for over a year. Land use regulations are not the sexiest thing to report on, but it's critically important that people understand how this rewrite will impact their ability to use their own land and hence their property value. Our reporting on the changes brought a lot of people to the table to talk to the Planning Commission and select board about the proposed changes and resulted in a set of changes that reflect full public participation. The first public hearing on these new changes takes place on Monday and we will cover that as well. Third, we celebrate the people in our community who do great things and we report on the community, the losses, the obituaries, the deer that hunters, the deer that hunters take. Four, we cover high school sports and review high school plays. And lastly, through our letters to the editor and social media, we create a way for our community members to interact with each other and public officials. All of this work is critical because it connects us and informs us, which in turn creates citizens who have the important knowledge they need to participate in our democracy. Thank you. And by the way, if folks, if folks don't know, Mr. Donahue has been a reporter here in Vermont for maybe four decades or so, 50. And uh, shine the light, right, Mike? You know, leader in those efforts. All right, and then Cassandra to talk a little bit about the bridge. Oh, you need a mic. It's on. I'm gonna stand over here so I don't have my back to folks. So I think the bridge might be a hybrid of some of what we've heard described. We are a small community newspaper in Montpelier, it used to be called the Montpelier Bridge. Um, we were founded in 1993 by a group of local citizens who wanted a newspaper devoted to Montpelier. Um, it's been through some interesting iterations. Uh, for a long time, we had, it, it was purchased and run by Nat Frothingham. So he was the publisher and editor. And then a few years ago, he retired and the bridge is now a state nonprofit. 
run by a board of directors, and we are in the process of applying to be a 501c3 nonprofit. So we don't have the long history of some of the older papers that go back to the 1800s, um, and we've been, a, I don't know if for-profit is really a fair term, but not a nonprofit. And now we're looking toward the nonprofit model because I think if I'm going to be completely frank and no surprises here, I'm not sure how the paper would exist without um, donations and some kind of support. We do have a sister organization called the Friends of the Bridge that raises money for the paper. We would not be able to operate without that. Um, and uh, I wrote down a few challenges and opportunities. That was my request. So I gave you a little background. I think our challenges are probably shared um, surviving on diminishing advertising revenue, or coming up with new creative ways to um, fund the paper, um, and staffing. Right now, similar to the Commons, we have myself and one other person who are actually in the office on any kind of a regular basis. Neither one of us are completely full-time, and we have a 15-hour-a-week contributing editor. Um, and then we have a huge amount of support at no cost from our board of directors. And there's some question about, you know, that's another challenge is boundaries. Where are the boundaries? And maybe that's okay that there aren't any, but the board of directors write stories for the newspaper. They're out there delivering papers. They're out there. Um, we have a designer on our board of directors. So he does a lot of design for us. Um, so one of the things, if I could get my wish, I would love to have a staff assignment reporter. We just don't, we don't have an assignment reporter. I have freelance writers, but you know, we don't have anyone I can say, school board meeting, Wednesday, cover it. And they, and they can't say, no, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> which is pretty much how it is now. Um, the other thing is uh, we're also, like all of you, we're a newspaper, we still print. And actually our board ha is committed to delivering, mailing the paper to every box in our postal code. That's, um, that's something the board really wants to do. And that happens twice a month for a teeny newspaper. That's a, a pretty big part of our budget. Um, and when I hear about the newspaper that I was raised on, I'm looking over at, I think someone else who might've been there, the Hardwick Gazette recently went totally digital. And this newspaper is printing and uh, buying postage. So it's a, there's models all over the place, but we're also digital. And so one of the challenges, how do we on this tiny staff get our print issue out, but we also have to be posting pretty regularly between issues. Um, so opportunities, um, the 501c3 may provide some grant opportunities. Um, I'm hoping we can find interns, that's an opportunity. And also, we're, I'd love to hear from other people how you build out your digital advertising. I mean, I realize this is an editorial focused conference, but we are just in the beginning stages of starting to um, build out digital advertising as well. Um, okay, that's a wrap. All right, questions or comments? And there also are some other, I don't know, Joe Gressner, did you, are you here? Yes, do you want to say anything about the Barton Chronicle? Sure. Um, I have the honor of being the editor of the Barton Chronicle. We are coming up on our 50th anniversary. It was founded by Chris and Ellen Braithwaite and Ed Cowan. Uh, Chris and Ellen were back to the landers and they found out the land didn't want them back. And they started a paper instead, which was just as crazy, but it turned out to be successful. Uh, we're very much a reflection of the Orleans County community, which means when it is prosperous, we're prosperous. When it isn't, we're not. And given the situation with dairy, COVID and everything else, things have been uh, difficult for everyone in our area. We are fortunate enough that Chris 
made it possible for the people who work at the paper to buy the paper. So we don't have an outside owner. We're able to produce something that we're proud of. And we don't have to make money for anyone else. If we can pay our salaries and at the end of the day um, not have a, you know, a hole in our pocket, we're doing OK. Um, we have been facing challenges that I think everyone who prints has been facing. Uh, a major one is the outrageous behavior of the post office, which was founded to distribute newspapers but has been working for the last 15 or 20 years to put them out of business. And um, if um, Congressman Welch can do something besides uh, just giving them more money, but also slap them upside the head, that would be very welcome. Uh, and I think that's about all I have to say except that we do have competition. There are two dailies in our area, so I think that's a good thing. Um, thank you, Joe. And if people haven't seen the Barton Chronicle, it's just a fabulous paper. And um, we have one of our graduates there as your assistant editor, I think. So remember, anybody can chime in anything, but I'm just going to call out because there are some local news, other local news providers. Tommy, Tommy Gardner, who represents multiple local papers. Tommy's getting organized. Just, just quickly, there are. This isn't just about content. It's also very much as as uh, the woman from the bridge was talking about sustainability and and balancing digital and print. And these are some of the things that we'll be discussing um, this afternoon. Go ahead. Hey everybody, um, I'm Tommy Gardner. I'm the uh, news editor for the Vermont Community Newspaper Group, which also means when I'm depending on when uh, what, what I'm writing about and who I'm talking to or who I'm asking questions from, I'm either, hi, it's Tommy from the Story Reporter, or hi, it's Tommy from the News and Citizen, or hi, it's Tommy from the other paper or the Shelburne News or the Citizen of Charlotte and Hinesburg, depending on you know what story I'm writing for. And, uh, and and in who I'm talking to, um, I was the uh, other reporter at the uh, the Gazette that you're talking about, as well as uh, I believe Ann got her uh, cut her teeth over there as well. And um, I guess yeah, we uh, I was doing a, a kind of a enumerating uh, the stories that I had to write, uh, and and Aaron had to write, and Corey had to write, and Avalon had to write for town meeting day, and I added it all up, and I had 13 pieces of copy running from two police blotters. Uh, uh, sports roundups for two high schools, five different town meeting wrap-ups, um, a correction, sorry about that, um, and the weather. I wrote the weather that week. And um, so this is the kind of thing that we have to do on a week-to-week -week basis in our papers. And um, and then we do it, I think, uh, on a kind of a small staff, which kind of, I'll shut up and pass a question on, if I can, to Steve, because you mentioned um, it is collaborate, right? Uh, the, uh, sorry, the... Um, the, the internship model and stuff like that. I was wondering if you have any uh, advice or, or um, you know, ideas on how to bring interns into a paper that uh, if they don't have oversight, because all of us have to do so many different things and whatnot. So I mean, interns are great, but they want to be paid, and they also need a little bit of supervision. So thanks. Um, so. Again, we're just putting all these ideas on the table. There'll be a longer period of time at lunch to talk about some of this stuff. But right next to you is Che. Che Evans. Che. <laughs> Do you want to just say a quick word about Charlotte? <laughs> Sorry, Che. And I You didn't say Chia, which is amazing, so thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm in Charlotte, and we are a news rainforest. There are several papers covering Charlotte. And um, what you said about the competition between the papers, I think it's great. I think um, we're all a bunch of, uh, of people who want to, you know, get it out there before everybody else. I think I have... So there's The Citizen, which is Charlotte and Heinsberg, and then there's the Charlotte News, and then there's me at the Charlotte Bridge. 
I think, um, I don't want to brag, but I might have a little bit of an advantage because I'm all online. I don't have, I miss having like a print paper because I've been both, I reported and edited both the Charlotte News and the Citizen before what I'm doing now. And I have the advantage of being able to just uh, shoot it out there in the middle of the night if I need to on email. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I just, and I'm also all by myself for the most part. I have a very generous um, copy editor and proofreader who is sometimes not available at 10 p.m. to go over what I've come up with, um, which is fun but also a little terrifying because uh, left to my own devices, it's not always the greatest, but I do my best. But anyway, so that's where we're coming from. I love having, um, I, I, I think it's really cool to have other people um, in the same town who are reporting on the same things. And there's no lack of drama, even in Charlotte, which has fewer than 4,000 people. Um, so that's my thought on the situation. <laughs> uh, no lack of drama, because there's local news. Um, Bridget, do you want to just say a word since you're right there at that table? Yeah. Um, hi there. Um, my name is Bridget Higdon. Um, I'm the managing editor at the St. Albans Messenger, um, the Colchester Sun, the Milton Independent, and the Essex Reporter. Um, <laughs> so um, in St. Albans, we're covering all of Franklin County at the moment. Um, it's got a twice weekly print edition as well as a daily website. Um, Colchester, Essex, and Milton are all digital at the moment. Um, but I've got a team of, um, there's six of us on staff at the moment. Um, so. Um, four news reporters um, for all four of those publications, um, a sports reporter, um, and myself as uh, managing editor. Um, I'm a UVM grad. I went to, uh, I studied English here, um, and I worked at the uh, student newspaper all four years. Um, so I'm sort of proud to say that I'm someone who uh, didn't grow up in Vermont, but grew up in New Jersey, um, had a great experience here, stayed, and I'm now giving back to the, to the community in, in this way. So. Thanks very much for having me. So we're going to move along, but I think that um, Jeannie Johnson from the Cabot Chronicle is here, maybe just. And no, OK. And um, let's see, a bunch of folks from those Shelburne News, other paper, Citizen. Let's see, and other local news providers uh, are probably here that I'm missing. Uh, anybody have a quick question or comment on this? Oh, of, yes, of course, Essex also. Um, anybody else have a quick question or comment before we move on? So Bill Schubert did have a question about, um, and, and maybe we'll get to this later because we're starting to be off time and I'm the big time person, um, but uh, about resistance to subscription costs for smaller papers. So I'm going to hold that, and I want to come back to it, but we'll go on with our models and our uh, speakers right now. So those of you from small papers, just think about that, jot down uh, a word or two about the resistance that you might be getting around subscription costs. Did I phrase that properly, Bill? OK. <laughs> Okay, so we are hearing about different models. Clearly, that's one way to survive. And Paula Routley from The Seven Days and Angelo Lynn are going to talk a little bit about things they're thinking about, whatever order they want to go. Angelo, and just one quick thing. All right, like, all right, I just can't help but say this. My first reporting job in Vermont was at the Addison Independent. Angela Lynn, I lasted a year and I'll never forget, I wrote a negative, unpolite story about the car dealers, which I never should have written, which the editor at the time was sort of on his way out and paid no attention to. And Angelo may have forgotten this, but they came in and asked them, asked him to fire me. And he didn't, and they pulled their advertising for a year, which was not a great thing, but anyway, that was where I learned to be a reporter. Paula. I don't know why I'm nervous, but I, I've written something. It's just, this is why I write, because I can't speak. 
publicly. But. Um, thank you for this opportunity to update you all on the topic of business models for sustainability, which is likely the primary reason we've got some publishers in the room today. Um, like them, one of my jobs is seven days is to make sure that we bring in enough money to pay for the product we create and give away for free. To finance the news gathering, photography and design, printing distribution, we've had to come up with some innovative revenue streams. Uh, a year ago, or a year or so before the pandemic, we set up a voluntary subscriber program to solicit donations, just in case. Um, a few super readers, as we called them, signed up, but we never really felt comfortable asking for money. That changed when the pandemic hit, uh, just like what Randy said. Um, I started writing a From the Publisher column once a week to let people know what the paper was up against and why it was important. And the donations started pouring in. Almost overnight, our relationship with our readers went from a measurement, uh, how many people picked up the paper and went to the website, to real personal connections. More than 3,000 people gave, money, gave us money uh, to help us get, to get through it. And many of those are now recurring monthly donors still generating about $2,000 a week. It costs a lot more than that to sustain our operation, but it has been incredibly helpful and a huge morale boost. Interacting with the super readers, I soon discovered that some of them wanted, wanted to give us larger sums, if only they could get a tax deduction for it. If we couldn't make that happen, they'd find a nonprofit news entity that could. That launched a two-year search, a way to find, uh, to find a way to make it possible for for-profit media outlets like Seven Days and even more crucially, small community newspapers like the Harvard Gazette and the Herald and Randolph to accept philanthropy. Readers and the IRS are coming to realize that what matters in journalism is responsible reporting, not legal structure. That is to say, for-profit does not necessarily mean anyone's making money, and non-profit doesn't rule out the possibility that an organization is rolling in dough. My first stop was the New England Newspaper and Press Association, which stepped in and quickly created a foundation that could act as a fiscal sponsor for its members. A number of Vermont newspapers set up fundraising pages on the foundation website, and it was going great until we realized the entity couldn't accept donor-advised funds, which a lot of people like to use, and the whole thing shut down. Colleagues at Willamette Week in Oregon suggested I try the, the Tides Foundation, which acts as a fiscal sponsor for them. Tides said no, they were moving in a different direction. Closer to home, the Vermont Community Foundation was supportive, but didn't have the bandwidth to take this on during the pandemic. Through Fran Stoddard, I made inquiries at the Vermont Journalism Trust, which funds Vermont Digger, but the board was wary of working with for-profit newsrooms. I talked with Burlington Center for Media and Democracy and VPR, too. And of course, I called Bill Schubart, because you got to call Bill Schubart. All great conversations, but none has led to the holy grail, a way to leverage philanthropic support for local news of all varieties. My friend and mentor, Angela Lynn, proposed the most elegant solution, tax deductibility for subscriptions and donations to any and all local media outlets. Unfortunately, that would take an act of Congress. At seven days, we found a short-term solution, the California-based journalism funding partners run by, a by former newspaper people has helped us outline three initiatives that qualify as charitable, and we've already had some fundraising success. But seven days is GFP's smallest partner, and the nonprofit doesn't have the capacity to work with other Vermont outlets. We need an organization that does. That is the shared goal that brought a small group of us together at the end of January for our first and only meeting. Kate and Bill Schubart, Angela Lynn, Fran Stoddard, Stephen Kiernan, and Michael, and Wood, Michael Wood Lewis and uh, Jason Von Dreisha from, from Porch Forum. Fran and Kate immediately set out to organize, or organize this event with Richard. Um, thanks to a generous donor, I have hired a lawyer and an account, accountant to turn Friends of Vermont Journalism into a reality. Brian Murphy and Wally Tapia are here, and they're both nonprofit experts. Now we just need an executive director. <laughs> that won't be me, but I'm happy to share what I've learned in the process, including different foundation and partnership models that are popping up around the country. I hope you'll join us in this effort to help Vermont struggling but vital community newspapers survive. As long. Thank you so much, Paula. And we'll turn it over to Angelo. You have a mic? 
Okay. Well, as long as you have a mic, we're good. Is that it? No, that's, that's yeah. working. Um, I, I'll just pick up where Paul left off on the uh, Act of Congress. Uh, <laughs> this idea about tax deductible uh, subscriptions or maybe even memberships isn't that far off. Uh, if you look at what we do, the community service that we provide, I think that's it's not too hard to get there. Um, and even in Canada, we just noticed that the Globe and Mail has a subscription notice that they send out, and there's a tax dedu deductible line line right on it. You know, so you check here, and it's and it computes the amount of your tax de uh, deductible expense. Well, when you think of this at fifty dollars a year, that's not much. But if you do this on a membership, and you have a tiered membership level, and you're going fifty, let's keep it at fifty a dollar a week for for all those people that can't afford more. But let's also have a $100 uh, rate, let's have a $200 rate, let's have a $500 rate, let's have a $1,000 rate. And this is a way that you get that message out that it needs to be funded. And if that's tax deductible to the donor, that starts to make a difference. You know, the independent, we have 8,000 paid subscribers, um, and suddenly we're getting 250 a year instead of 50 on average, which is what we do now. That's about $500,000. That's enough to make a difference. That's enough to replace some advertising. So that's what we're talking about. That's, these are the types of ideas that we're talking about. And let me just address a couple of things. Um, you know, we're being nice out here. We're, we're kind of dancing around the, the core issue here. And the core issue is advertising sales are down. They're going to be down. Uh, particularly in rural, rural Vermont, rural America. And this is because of a couple of things, right? We have fewer kids. Uh, in schools, we have we have our demographics have changed. In in Middlebury, when I was there, uh, when my kids were in school, 25 years ago, the school was 660 kids in Mary Hogan, Middlebury. It's 400 today. The town is the same size, or population is the same. The demographics have changed that much. Consequently, we have fewer retail stores. Uh, selling, at, you know, selling goods to families and that sort of thing. We have lots of art, <laughs> we have gifts, we have real estate, but we don't have that retail store that used to support newspapers. Uh, that's not going to change. Uh, the, the, you know, you add in um, social media and how that's diversified uh, the advertising market. You add in Amazon and how that's taken away a lot of retail and it's not coming back. So we have to replace that funding. We 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 used to be eighty percent advertising, 20% subscription, roughly, somewhere in those in that ballpark. And we need a three-legged model. We need subscriptions. Uh, we need to get more from our readers. We need to get advertising still, and, and that still is a big chunk of our, of our payroll, or of our revenue. And we need some, some donor funds, some bigger funds, some grant funds. When we look at on the landscape about who's giving money to to whom in this in this marketplace, this media marketplace, there's a lot of money being given. There's a lot. And the pandemic helped us realize that people would also give to that community newspaper. Part of our problem is we need to tell a better story about what we do out there, and we need to ask. And part of the challenge there is it takes staff to ask. It takes staff to put together a campaign to go out there and do this. It's another full-time salesperson to do that. And we all ought to be looking at this in those sorts of terms. But we can't get there until we have, you can't really get to money until you have a, a fund that can make it tax deductible. We ran into the same problem a couple of years ago. When Paula came to me about this problem, I was dealing with the same problem. I had a donor that wanted to give me $10,000. Right in the, you know, come forward here, it's a tax, but it's a tax advisor fund, and they wanted that deduction. So that's what we tried to do when I was president of NEMPA in Boston, was set this up. It took two years of legal work, <laughs> and we still didn't get it done. It's fairly complicated. It doesn't seem like it should be, but it's fairly complicated. And I can tell you this, Paul and I have two of the bigger weekly publications in the state. We don't have time to do it. We can't spend all of our time out there doing this. 
you take a paper that has three or four people on their staff, they can't do that. They can't do it. There's not enough time in the day to do this. Um, so this is a reason that an that a organization such as, as we're talking about makes a real big difference. And let me just, you know, if I could have jumped up and uh, stood up and applauded um, when the dean at UVM gave $100,000 to this effort, that is huge. That is huge. That really puts some legs under this and it makes it possible because what we need to do is set up a template for this so that we can help every paper in the state so that you can apply to this and, and uh, we can get you some money when we need to before you go out of business. And this is, I'm going to wrap this up in one minute. It is, we, we are close, however. There are lots of newspapers out there that can't make it. Um, so we need to be able to get this money to them uh, beforehand. And the responsibility of each of the publishers, editors, and publishers in the room, keep it open. If you need help, ask for it. Don't shut down. Don't create a news desert. It's much easier to keep something going than it is to have to start something new again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelo. Incredibly important message. The Western Iowa Journalism Foundation uh, is a model that's out there. I encourage you to go to that website, look at it. There's some problems with it. We'll talk about those later. But just so you know that there are models, there's lots of models out there that's being done like this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelo. We're really laying the groundwork here for work we're going to be doing later. And I'd like to move on to digital content, if, if we could, Richard. Any? Yes, right back here. Here, I'm, I'm on my way. Uh, just to sort of state the blatantly obvious, it's become clear to me, uh, maybe everybody else has already uh, come to this point, but uh, having bounced back and forth between community journalism and nonprofit theater, um, it, what the problem it seems like to me is that when I worked in theater, you, uh, we could take donations, but we couldn't sell memberships because you get tickets. If you get something in return, then that's not considered a donation. And if you're a for-profit, you can sell something, but you can't take a donation. So I think that sort of legally is the problem that we need to find a solution to. Fantastic. And it's from the Charlotte News. I'm sorry, your name just so we... Oh, I'm sorry. Scooter McMillan. Scooter, thank you so much. Okay. If, if anybody has... It. You know, I'm going to add one um, relevant point to this because we were talking about... I was fact-checking checking my answer to Tim on competition, and I think this is an important thing to point out because so many people have alluded to it. Um, the argument that more competition is always better for news organizations is only true, according to the social science, when um, it doesn't hold when everyone is a for-profit entity in a free market. In fact, that actually tends to drive down coverage of public policy and public affairs and drive up entertainment coverage, the sugary stuff. Um, but when some, some element of a news environment has the kind of safety of being supported by foundations, philanthropy, donors, tax deductions, a state-sponsored model, like think BBC, something like that. There is a little bit more. It sort of, it, it inoculates them from some of those market forces and it kind of protects some of that harder coverage. So I think it's just a reminder that um, a some sort of hybrid model woven into the state of Vermont is actually the ideal. It is not in fact uh, kind of the, we, we sort of think of it as a kind of like patchwork solution, um, but in fact, it actually drives more substantive coverage for um, readers and consumers. So, anyways, I'd like I'd love to hand this to somebody else who has any questions. Uh, 
All right, should we move on to our next speaker? So digital content. Okay, so we have, who do we have next? Oh, Sarah Ashworth of VPR. Lisa next, and Sarah. 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 Hi. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Ashworth. I'm at VPR and Vermont PBS now. Um, I'm just happy to be in this room and talking about um, with a group of people who are committed to helping local journalism thrive and talking through what it's going to take to do that here in the state and do it together. I know it's digitizing content. It's also reader engagement I read on the agenda. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about reader engagement because I've been thinking about that a lot. And more and more, you know, I started out as a reporter and thinking about my colleagues as other reporters, editors, producers, many of us in this room as who my colleagues were in journalism. And I've been trying to think and talk with our newsroom more about how our colleagues are community members and people in the community and we're partners with people in the community in making content together. And as part of now a merge team with video and radio and um, digital as well that um, we're trying to focus on impactful and inclusive work and thinking about, as I said, community members as key partners in that and thinking what does our community need from us now how can we best provide it for them? And we don't know the answer right now, but we're gonna do the work to figure out what that looks like going forward. And I hope that that's gonna create programs and content and things that, that have a big impact and feel like they matter in people's lives here in the state. As I said, I head up our content and news team at uh, this newly merged organization. And as we're shifting our relationship from making content for people, sort of delivering it one way to people and thinking how do we work with people to make something new, something we couldn't ever do on our own as a team of journalists sitting in a room together thinking through it. Um, I'm also thinking a lot about how more people can see and hear themselves in our journalism and also how to make our work really inclusive and shared on audio, video, and digital, and what does that look like, and how do we decide where it goes at any time? Um, and we need the public's help to be able to figure, to answer those questions. And so we're doing some of that work now. We have a podcast that's been on the, um, on the air and out digitally for a while called Brave Little State. It's centered on answering audience questions. We have our reporters. Um, they just are writing mission statements now and sharing why they do the work they do and the questions that they would like some help answering and inviting people to fill out an easy online form or leave a voicemail with questions and ideas for coverage, and we're calling it engaged beat building. Um, and we're also, as an organization, doing an audience segmentation study right now. And it's not about understanding who VPR and Vermont PBS is or who we have been, but figuring out who is in the community. And then back to that original question of thinking like, what needs do they have? And what are ways that we as a media organization can start to step in? and work with people to address those needs. Um, so in terms of digital, I come from a broadcast background, public radio background, but I am really also thinking about how do we make journalism for people who are never gonna own a radio, never wanna own a radio, don't even know what that would look like or where you would get one. Same with the television as well now too. People have no interest in owning a television, but they are interested in what's happening in their communities. So what does our journalism look like now because of that? Um, and because of feeding all of those platforms, thinking about digital, you know, it's questions about resources and sustainability as well. And I know questions that we all share around that and thinking, um, you know, that there's potential for us to work together as organizations to figure those questions out. And I think about, you know, there are lots of competitors. I think Tom mentioned, you know, or Tim mentioned um, that our competitors are everywhere. I think about that. On our smartphone, every app is a competitor to our local journalism. And you know our competitors aren't each other necessarily in this room. So I'm eager also to talk about how we might all work together to deliver better local journalism on digital platforms, more and more so, and just you know wherever people want it and need it. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm very happy now. Unless, does anybody have any questions specifically about Sarah's comments? All right, I'm 
excited now to introduce you to Lisa Scagliotti, if you're ready for us, um, from the Waterbury Roundabout, one of our successful partners in this mission. You have a mic. Good. Um, I'm going to go. I want to back to everybody. Good morning, everyone. Um, boy, this has been uh, great to hear about all these different models and great to try to figure out where what I do fits in. And I feel like I've got a little bit of pieces from a lot of the models that we've heard from. Um, I'm kind of with the new kid on the block. It's called waterburyroundabout.org. Um, it's a website that started as a class project um, here at UVM um, soon after the pandemic hit in early 2020. Um, I previously had been um, an editor and a reporter um, with the Vermont newspaper group um, here based in Stowe. I was an editor with the two of their weekly papers and then started working with UVM to help create this internship program. Um, and we were starting to feed um, local newspapers with stories that were done by students, but I was the editor to sort of help, you know, kind of shape those. Um, then the pandemic hit in March of 2020, and one of the six newspapers closed, um, and that was the Waterbury Record, um, and I happen to live in Waterbury. Um, so it was really sad, and the community was sad. We understood the reasons for it, um, and it was a really bad time to lose a newspaper. Um, so here I was working with Richard um, at, at UVM, and we had these students, and none of them bailed out of the internship program that semester, which was fantastic, even though they were all working remotely. And we decided to turn some of our attention to Waterbury. Um, so one of the students was um, really good at, at the whole website thing, and she created the website that you see today if you go to waterburyroundabout.org. Um, and we started writing stories. And I guess, I don't know, I feel like the moral of the story is I, I'm a bit of an example of maybe what not to do because I really didn't think about the business part of this. I'm a, I'm a newspaper reporter and editor. It's sort of been my background all along, and that's what I love and what I do. And I, we just started covering stories. And I didn't really think about the fact that we were starting a business. Um, but by the summer of 2020, we had registered with the Secretary of State in order to open a bank account. Um, and so we're now registered as a state nonprofit business. Um, and we got aboard that uh, campaign that Paula talked about with NEMPA. Um, we jumped on that. Uh, the folks at NEMPA were like, yep, you're online. You can do this. And we raised about $7,000 in the fall of 2020, which was really helpful. Um, I've been super stingy with that money, which makes me feel like maybe I am sort of on my way to being a publisher. <laughs> um, I've been really careful doling that out. <laughs> um, and so um, by the fall of, of 2020, the folks at the Times Argus came to me and they said, um, boy, we're starting to do this free weekly little paper that we're going to be mailing around central Vermont. And we see that you're covering Waterbury News and we're doing this by zip codes. We could actually put Waterbury News into this weekly thing that we're sending around. Um, and so that was one of the biggest questions I was getting in the community. People loved the fact that we started covering local news. They were using the website, they were on the website, but I was constantly like getting stopped at the grocery store by people saying, when are you going to bring back a paper? And I would say, ah. my pat answer became, if the paper was easy to continue to do, there would still be the Waterbury record, right? So I don't have the answer to that question. Um, so the Times Argus came to me and they said, you know, we will pay you for your content if we could put it in this little paper so we're not just sending warmed over Times Argus content everywhere. So now we have, it's just eight pages. It's called the Waterbury Reader and it comes out free every week in the mailbox to the two zip codes that serve our town. There's the coloring contest for St. Patrick's Day back there. Um, and so we started that in the fall of 2020. So we've been doing that over a year now. Um, and it's been a lot because I'm continuing to work with the internship program. We've had one or two students that are helping us every semester and that changes every few months. So it's great to have the interns contributing and to give them a chance to write stories that land in a real paper and, and on a real website, talking to real people and not just be class assignment kind of things. Um, but that does take time to help supervise as well. Um, I have a partner, uh, Gordon Miller, who's a local photographer who um, lives in Waterbury and um, shoots for local papers, including the Stowe papers still. He's able to give me a few hours a week. Um, his work is all over our website, makes it look really good. And he's also a great local journalist. So he's, he is like my other sounding board when we go to brainstorm questions to ask select board candidates. Um, but as far as impact goes, I want before I, I, I go away here, um, Right now, we push out our stories with a newsletter once a week um, that we send out on email to um, over 1,700 people every Saturday. 
Um, we have about 1,800 followers on Facebook where we also pu publish our, our stories, um, put those out there. A lot of our readers are there. Our readers are not on Twitter, I found that out. Um, and we also have the, the weekly paper that comes out as well. Um, we saw the impact of what we do really play out in the last couple weeks with Town Meeting Day. Um, I, sometimes I've been asking myself, why am I doing this? Because I really have not cracked the financial nut of this yet to be able to get help um, other than a handful of freelancers. Thank you, Mike Donahue, who's often has bylines on, on the roundabout. Um, but we started seeing letters to the editor, posts on Front Porch Forum, posts on people's Facebook pages saying, um, to support this candidate, to vote for this item that's on the ballot, and go to the Waterbury Roundabout and see this article about it. Go and see more about this person, by, and I read about this. And so we're starting to see this conversation where people were using the website and, and telling people, go check this out because that's how I found out about this. Not able to do candidate profiles, I sent out a survey to the, the Live League candidate list for our select board and publish their answers verbatim, and it got over a thousand hits on our website within a week and a half. Um, they, these responses came out and there were four candidates for two seats. Um, one candidate was the chair of our planning commission. The other three people had never been in public service at all. There were some interesting options on that ballot. Um, we published, we let their words speak for themselves in the survey. Within a few days of the survey being out, there was a campaign happening in our town to draft somebody else to run. And there was a candidate who kind of thought about running and didn't sign up in time and wasn't on the ballot. They drafted him and within a week before the race, he got into the race. I sent him the survey, he answered the questions, we added them onto the website, a whole new flurry of hits all over that survey. And then letters to the editor started coming in, posts on front porch forums started pouring in. Town meeting day came, the write-in candidate came in second place and he won one of the two seats. And so people really got engaged and got, and got very involved in this. And so it was really fascinating to see how this, how this happened. And so every story needs a good quote. So I'm gonna leave you with one of my favorite comments that we saw after the election. Um, so one of the folks that helped coordinate this draft this uh, last minute candidate had a, a comment on his Facebook from a, a friend who thanked him for organizing this and for getting this candidate on the ballot because now he's gonna be one of our new select board members. She says, I'm very thankful. I read the candidate interviews from the roundabout and I was like, oh shit, these options, except Alyssa who did an excellent interview, do not look good for our community. <laughs> I voted for Alyssa and I wrote in Roger, thanks to the great information from the community and the local news. Kudos to all of you. Love your work, Lisa, thank you so much. And Richard, we should move on. Okay, um, well, let's move on, but uh, hopefully we'll get to talk more about these things. And Lisa has been a ball of fire yes. in the Waterbury roundabout. I didn't, she didn't say yes. her click-through rates, but they're like 60, 70, 80% or people are clicking on your emails every week. And to have VPR and Sarah here and Scott, I mean, MP Vermont Public, media. <laughs> um, so much there that we can keep pondering how to bring it all together. Um, so our next quick little flurry of activity is hugely important about content or whatever the folks in this section want to get into. And of course, we all know the amazing work that Anne Galloway has done in bringing VT Digger to life. And then we'll also hear from, ah, Michael Wood Lewis, if he's here, or Jason, Michael, to talk a Michael's bit here. about the role that Front Porch Forum, which has come up a few times already, Michael, could play here. And lastly, we have Corey, who you may have seen wandering around, who is our editor, the person we hire to manage our students to help provide the content for folks that need it at the quality that you need it. So, Anne, kick us off, wherever you are, there. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Anne Galloway, I started uh, VT Digger in uh, 2009. It feels like uh, a century ago at this point. I've got the gray hairs to prove it, although I've colored my hair so you can't see it. 
Um, <laughs> you know, we, we formed uh, to fill gaps in uh, the media landscape at a time when things started to fall apart and uh, things haven't gotten better, I'm afraid. And that's why we're all here today in this room. And um, from the beginning, since 2000, well, as soon as we had a reporter, <laughs> we were able to start sharing content with other news organizations. And so we started doing that in 2013 uh, with the Star Reporter Group and with others. And the idea was that we would essentially be the State House Bureau for local newspapers. And um, we uh, gave our content to folks for a very low fee. Um, it was, I think, 30 to $40 a week, depending on if you were a weekly or a daily, and you could take whatever you wanted off of our website. And that was how we started to um, find a way to collaborate with news organizations around the state. I do think that collaboration in a competitive environment is hard, but it's also uh, really essential now for all of this. Um, we also have had experiments with other news organizations around the state. We shared reporters with the Bennington Banner and with the Brattleboro Reformer at one point. Uh, we worked on projects with uh, Vermont Public Radio. Uh, we offered to sell our statehouse content to the Burlington Free Press um, and others. Uh, that We weren't taken up on that offer, by the way. <laughs> um, and um, we also carry uh, content from the Cynic uh, and um, and we, we've been uh, a proud supporter and publisher of the community news service um, work by, by students. And um, we're also um, experimenting with fiscal agency um, because we see the need here and we've heard it loud and clear from Angelo and Paula. And actually we did extend uh, fiscal agency to the Waterbury Roundabout last year as an experiment. The board approved that as a pilot project and um, we take a small fee uh, for administrative costs, but the idea is that Lisa has her own bank account. We, you know, send her money when it, once a month when, you know, she, her donate page is hooked up to our bank account basically. Um, and this is actually something that um, I mentioned to Fran Stoddard in a meeting we had, um, gosh, a while ago in which I said, you know, if there are others that want to become nonprofits, there is a possibility that we could consider providing, um, and it'd be up to the board ultimately, but um, fiscal agency for others. The trouble is, um, as Paula mentioned, we can't, um, under IRS rules, um, provide a pass-through for for-profits. Um, that would be really um, dicey for our 501c3. But I, I do think that there is an opportunity for us Potentially, if um, others in, in my, on my team uh, and, and on the board agree, it's, uh, it is something that uh, we are considering seriously. Um, and our first experiment is, is with uh, Lisa. And um, so uh, what else was I going to say? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that this is a good conversation. I'm really glad you're having it because um, Local news is critically important. Uh, statewide news organizations like Digger um, really are surfacing um, local news of statewide import. We cannot replace um, the hyperlocals, and we have no intention of trying to do that because it's um, that's that's the real community work that's essential. And how we figure out together um, how to how to keep. Um, the, these organizations sustainable is just critically important to the future, not only of journalism, but of our state. And um, so thank you for inviting me to come and uh, to speak briefly. And Michael Wood Lewis of Front Porch Forum. We're all quite familiar. Thanks, thank Fran. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's kind of fun having the power of making everyone do uh, conference chair yoga here. So look over there, look over there. Um, keep us moving. Well, um, I'm glad to see everybody today. I wish I could see your faces to see if you're smiling or frowning. Oh, sure. Maybe I will stand over there so I'm not. 
and on the camera. But, uh, um, you know, Front Porch Forum is not, uh, you know, doesn't belong here in my old Sesame Street uh, view. You know, one of these things doesn't belong here. Which one? We're not journalists. We don't hire and employ journalists. Um, Front Porch Forum is not uh, in the direct news business. I want to state that very clearly. That said, over the, oh, about 20 years we've been doing this service in Vermont, we find ourselves as part of the news ecosystem. Um, so, Fran, you said my name. Michael Wood Lewis, my wife Valerie and I co-founded Front Porch Forum um, in our Burlington neighborhood, uh, just down the hill here in, in 2000. We now serve every community in Vermont with a local online forum that's moderated by our staff of Vermonters. Um, some days you may not think it's moderated, depending on which community you live in. Um, but uh, we are a mission-driven, uh, family-owned, for-profit Vermont business. We're a public benefit corporation that puts our social mission on the same plane as our financial goals. We employ 24 people across the state uh, who moderate the content day in and day out, who sell advertising to local businesses. We, we are in that same line of work. Um, and we're in there every day. Uh, town meeting is a big deal for us um, and presents all sorts of challenges. I, I tend not to, over, over time, the way I think of all this, I know, I know I'm supposed to be getting on, into content here, is not uh, journalism versus social media or print versus digital or, you know, us versus them. The us versus them that I haven't heard touched on at all here is Vermont businesses, Vermont nonprofits, Vermont efforts versus global big tech. Um, you know, I, we all depend on Facebook. Uh, you know, Facebook is a lot like cigarettes and we're a lot like people in the 60s who are like, oh, this isn't bad for me. There, there's no downside here. Um, yeah, Facebook is destroying our communities um, in many ways, uh, whether you're talking about January 6th or whether you're talking about local economies. Um, and we're addicted. We're addicted to, to this cigarette. So sometimes people say, Front Porch Forum, that's like Vermont's Facebook. I'm like, ah, no. Uh, you know, that's not what we do. We're driven by a very different set of uh, values and principles. And we don't get it right every day, um, and, but we are open for feedback. We are working hard to always be improving our model. So when I think of content, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that so many journalists use our free service to connect with the, their communities. Uh, we see every day uh, reporters using Front Porch Forum. We're, we're, we're thrilled, that's, that's great. We're glad to make that contribution. FPF is often a source in local news stories. We also have seen, uh, anecdotally, I don't have any data to back this up, that Front Porch Forum um, it is uh, uh, increasing the audience for local news. People who weren't paying attention to local news join Front Porch Forum for the free couch or the lost dog, and before you know it, they're paying attention to the school board, school budget debate, and they get drawn in, and they say, I, I actually want to read you know, some journalism about this, and they go to, go to the local news source. We are eager to do more. Uh, Front Porch Forum has tremendous reach. For every 1,000 households in the state, we have 750 members who are looking at Front Porch Forum day in and day out and participating. Half our members contribute content every year. So we don't have any solutions here, but we, we are open. We, we are part of the ecosystem and we'd love to talk. Corey will uh, close out this, this section. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, of course, from Community News um, yes. Service. Yes. I, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Corey Dawson. I run the Community News Service here at UVM. Um, 
So we have interns anywhere from 20 to 40 some odd interns every semester who are working in, in newsrooms on the state. So there are several several folks here who do have uh, CNS interns with them. Anyone raise their hand, raise your hands if you have a CNS intern or have used CNS work. So we'd love to get more <laughs> to your newsrooms. Um, and actually, we have one intern here. It's UV, it's break. So Noah Lafaso is a CNS intern now. We'll take any uh, job offers for Noah on the table over here. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, we, all our content is is free. All our stories are free for newsrooms. The 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 interns work for newsrooms for free. Um, and this is a a, a very beneficial, um, mutually beneficial relationship. It's it's a win win. Um, students get credit for this work, their work is shared, they get to understand what's going on in these communities, and readers get to understand what's going on in these communities. Um, I also want to highlight that it's not just UVM that's doing work like this. There are, uh, there are universities and colleges around the state that have similar programs, and if we can't get you an intern, I'm sure there are other uh, colleges that can. New 7 at Linden, uh, Linden College, um, has a excellent program called New Seven, and they uh, cover uh, their, the communities around that. That college, Castleton University, um, provides interns to the Rutland Herald, and they have their own great newspaper. So, the point is, is that there are uh, many interns who want to do this work, and uh, I've been, <laughs> frankly, shocked that there is so many. There are so many interns who will go and cover a select board meeting. There are, uh, and we want to get them into your newsrooms. Um, so I'm really going to use this time to to highlight that and to to make connections with people who we don't have interns at your uh, at your newsrooms. Um, you know, I'm I am teaching them the skills that I have learned as reporters in newsrooms. Um, you know, Burlington Free Press, BT Digger, they they hired me as a young reporter, and I am trying to teach them the skills that uh, made me successful in those newsrooms and helped readers understand those issues. So I hope that these interns uh, can be a great farm team for um, for your newsrooms um, and can really support you all in this work. It's it's important to understand as well the limitations of this work. You know, these interns are are great. They're very um, they're very skilled, but they are also here to help you all do the work that you need to do. Um, in many cases, they're here to do um, the, the basic stories, the profiles, you know, the meeting coverage, so that you can perhaps do the work, the, the more in-depth work, the more investigative pieces that you might need to do, and hopefully give you a little bit of breathing room. So this is this is what we are trying to do. This is how we're trying to help. So please, I'm I'm very happy to hear ideas and help you all get interns into your newsrooms. So thank you. Okay, we have one more session. There is coffee over there, but the they're gonna move that out, bring in lunch in a little bit, and then there will be more coffee in the afternoon, I believe. So, thank you all for <laughs> sitting here for an hour and a half or so. And um, our next session is going to just throw out some ideas of other models that are happening, and of course, at the beginning of many of these conversations is Lauren Glenn Davidian, Town Meeting TV. Lauren will talk about some of the work that they do uh, and around the state. And um, from New Hampshire, New Hampshire, uh, <laughs> Melanie Plenda, there's something called the Granite State Collaborative where there's 20 or so media organizations that are working together to share content that Melanie will tell us about. And uh, go on even sort of bigger scale, Bill Densmore here, will Densmore will finish this off talking about some other models that he is involved with. So, without further ado, Lauren. Sorry. Hi. Does everybody want to just get up for one second? Just ever, just like up one second, like, like a two second yoga break. Like stretch your arms and have a breath, five deep breaths, five deep breaths into your masks. <laughs> Thank you so much. There we go. That oh, feels so much better. Turn of the shoulders. How, I, anyway, today was the first day I had to think about what I was going to wear for two years. <laughs> I'm wearing, I'm wearing exactly the same thing I would normally be wearing, but I had to think about it a little bit more. 
I'm Lauren Glendavidi, and I'm the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy, which started out in 1984 as Chittenden Community Television. And at that time, the only um, outlets that non-professional media makers and citizen activists had to speak their truth about what they thought was happening in their communities was a letter to the editor or possibly a radio editorial. <clears throat> so it was our intent to liberate the means of production and distribution for media making for the people, and that was the birth of public access television in Vermont. And at that time, there were people all over the country trying to do the same things, knocking on the door of cable companies and saying, we know that you're using the public rights of way, and in exchange for that, you need to provide a public benefit. And those public benefits need to be channels and a percentage of your revenue so that we can tell our stories. So flash forward from 1984, when there were 50 cable companies in the state of Vermont, now there are six, where Vermont <clears throat> had countless radio news operations just here in Burlington. I think there were at least four radio news operations and the newsrooms were locally controlled and the Burlington Free Press was actually in Burlington. And now there are 24 community media centers all across the state of Vermont. And the reason that we're here I think was very well teed up by Michael is that we are part of a media ecosystem of which journalism has a central and necessary place, as does community media, which is the modern term for public educational and government access, because of course we don't think of ourselves anymore as simply cable TV public interest. We actually serve on multiple platforms, and I would just like to point out a couple of important things that you might not be aware of the only live election results that were done in Chittenden County were done at Town Meeting Television. <clears throat> That's what Megan O'Rourke, who's here, runs. Um, the only connection, live connection, that people had to their local governments during the pandemic was to the public meetings that were covered all across the state. There are at least 100 public town meetings covered last week. But for the past two years, the community media centers, including Jess Wilson Media Factory, have been providing live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of public meetings. That is the backbone of what the journalists here rely on to get the work done. We have 41,000 pieces of media, media in our archives dating back to 1984. Jordan Mitchell, our archivist, is here. 41,000 pieces of video archives, a thousand of those happened to be Bernie Sanders. <clears throat> Politico helped us digitize all of them a couple years ago, or yeah, it was a couple years ago. And that archive is a necessary and vital record of what has happened in this community over four decades. What we're doing in Burlington and in Chittenden County is being replicated in the 24 community media centers all across the country. At the same time, our primary revenue source, we are all nonprofits, our primary revenue source has been cable television subscriptions. And that business has been disrupted, just like the news business has been disrupted. Now this is something that we've seen coming since 1990. It's not a big surprise, but of course, the number of cable subscriptions are declining rapidly. And the foundation of this revenue source is that these are commercial users of the public rights of way. So Congress, in 1984, when they passed the Cable Communications Act, basically wrote down that there should be a quid pro quo for the commercial use of the public rights of way. Now, unfortunately, Congress has written laws that prohibit us from getting a similar quid pro quo from internet revenue. Funny, but they figured that out, and they've made it very difficult for us to transplant this policy directive onto a percentage of use for internet providers, even though the exact same cables 
that cable companies are providing video on, they're providing internet on, but there's not the same public policy basis. So it has always been part of our work to not just liberate the means of production so that people can tell their stories and can counter sometimes the narrow journalistic stories that are told and can amplify the stories that are told in local newspapers. It's not just that we are trying to open the doors of local government to promote transparency and local democracy, and it's not just that we're trying to preserve local history with our archives, and it's not just that we're trying to train the next generation with our media education work, which we proudly do. But we have to be policy wonks. We have to understand the foundation and the premise upon which the revenue is based for community media, just like with Congressman Welch and the bill that you're thinking about, we have to be policy wonks as publishers and journalists. So luckily, and I'll just wrap up, the um, Vermont legislature identified our work as an essential service during the pandemic. Um, we were just able to, in addition to COVID funds, negotiate $300,000 for the community media centers in the budget adjustment of 22. We're going for 600,000 for the budget adjustment 23. And these are short-term bridge funding requests while we prepare to rewrite the policy in the state of Vermont. So the Vermont legislature can use what authority it has to reorganize how community media is funded. So I would leave that as kind of an inspiring alternative story and to say that without partnerships, we, none of us are going to be able to do the work going forward, and we certainly look to continue that. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no questions at this time, I think we'll move on to our next speaker then. I'm very excited to introduce you, Melanie Plenda of the New Hampshire Radio. Hi, I'm Melanie Plenda. I'm the director of the Granite State News Collaborative, and I, I feel obligated, though, to say first as a neighbor but an outsider of Vermont, um, I have consumed a lot of the news represented here, and I am a diehard admirer. You're doing amazing work. And I know we're supposed to be competitors and all that, but you're doing amazing work. And the dedication and passion that brings you here to keep this public service that we all believe in alive is palpable. And, and I really commend all of you for being here and doing what you're doing. So I just wanted to say that very first and foremost. Um, but the Granite State News Collaborative, and I will use notes because no one told me uh, that as a journalist I would ever have to do public speaking, and it is not my jam. So, um, so we are a collective of more than 20 local media outlets, also a university, our press association, and community partners who are non-journalists but do provide content uh, to it. So we work with a lot of, we like to collaborate. That is our thing. And so we collaborate with pretty much anybody that's aggressively nonpartisan and, and all that kind of good stuff. How this works is we, when we started, we were solely project-based, but during the pandemic, we realized that we could do a whole lot more together because we needed to, because we needed to, none of us were gonna be able on our own to cover the pandemic and get people what they needed. So we needed to work together in order to do that. So we set up a, a system for communicating with each other. We set up a system for sharing stories with each other. And then the collaborative itself has a team of freelance investigative reporters that fill in the gaps. So we kind of fill in those like time intensive, resource intensive kind of projects and series and stories um, that the outlets just couldn't do during the pandemic. And we give those all to our partners. They can share them across any platform. It's all free, they don't pay in. Then the partners themselves also, uh, again, during the pandemic, they share their own content. And I'm, I'm the one who pulls it all into, um, 
you know, our very sophisticated Google folder that we share with each other um, and make sure that everybody has what they need. They get their photos, their cut lines, their stories. They can run them with very few exceptions without restriction on any of their platforms. And um, by doing that, in the last 18 months, we've cross-posted more than 3,000 stories across the state of New Hampshire. This is in print, in digital, uh, you name it, we, we have them as our partners. We have our NHPR station, we have an NHPBS station, um, and the collaborative itself has contributed more than 600 of those stories to our partners. And it's many, more often than not, stories that couldn't have been done otherwise. We just completed an um, eight-month investigation into uh, the impacts of exclusionary zoning in our state. And we've been able to show through data, because we also have a shared data uh, editor that is at the disposal of all of our partners. Um, we were able to show through data how this is impacting affordable housing, crime, um, homelessness, the refugees in our state. And we were only able to do that because the collaborative exists, because everyone's working together, because of the resources we can provide to our partners. Um, a couple other things I'll mention is that um, you know our our team of reporters they produce their own stuff, but they also we kind of look at them as like a little mini investigative SWAT team, so they can like go out and work for short periods of time with our partners on projects. And the only caveat is, and we pay for that. Um, and the only caveat is that they have to just share that content with everybody without restriction and and. They're like, yeah, great, give me the reporter. So, so then they get to have these projects that, again, they wouldn't have gotten to have. Um, by working together with our public radio or our public te television station, we've produced um, 85 episodes of a public, a digital public affairs show that is also shared with the partners. We share both the video and a Q&A print version so that all of our partners can participate in that, our print included. Um, we also have launched with our uh, educational partner, Franklin Pierce. We uh, launched two new podcasts that are also shared print and digital. How I know that this is working is, let me make sure that I have all my list. So one thing I know is that because of our network, of our, our distribution network, some of our partners have actually been able to leverage that into grant funding for themselves. Because they can tell people, they can tell funders, hey, if you help our outlet do this thing or with this reporter, not only are you helping us, but we're sharing all that content with all of these partners across the state. So those stories don't just live there anymore. Now they're going across the state. More people are getting more news for fewer resources. Our partners then build on that reporting and all of that gets shared. So, so it it's really has a multiplier effect, which philanthropists really like, and, and I get that, uh, and it's a good thing. Um, the other thing is I have had editors report to me that they're able to redeploy their own resources to more hyper-local uh, issues and topics that they might not have been able to cover because something that's happening that day that's of statewide impact is already being covered by one of the partners and is going to be shared. So now they're getting more hyper-local news, which is what's bringing people to their sites and their papers, but they're also able to provide all of this really rigorously reported, vetted, trusted statewide content. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's a, there's been a reduction in the duplication of efforts for the very reason that I just said. So again, shit, saving of resources, conserving of resources. Um, not all of our partners like co-production, and that's okay. We like to take partners where they're at and at the level at which they're willing to participate. But this year, the, the project that I mentioned, the eight-month project, we did have for the first time, we had five partners uh, work on that project together. And I, it's a little bit of a logistical dance to make that happen, but it did. And so we were able to get that done. And... Um, I will kind of end with this anecdote. You talk about competition and um, collaboration, and collaboration always looks good on paper, but everybody's got the thing in the back of their head, like, how is this gonna work? Who's gonna have buy-in? We're gonna end up doing more, they're gonna end up doing less, we're a special snowflake, they're not, it's all, I mean, everybody has those same things. And in fact, on my first day of work, my very first day, 
Uh, and I had to give a speech that day too, and it was not good. And um, one of our, <laughs> there was a, an outlet there, and I went up to the editor, and I was very earnest, and was like, hey, you want to join the collaborative? It's so fun, it's great, it's a good idea. And he looked me dead in the eye, and he's like, Melanie, we will never join the collaborative. And I was like, why? <laughs> and, and he said, we do not work well with others. I'm not kidding. He now is one of our biggest supporters and our most active collaborative member. So if that guy can join, if that guy can collaborate, really anybody can. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any, um, other than to say that it works and it's replicable. So if anyone does have questions, I'm happy to help. Awesome. Thank you so much. Our, our neighbors and more from our neighbors in New Hampshire. Bill Dunsmore is, uh, has, an academic and a uh, supporter of all this. I love the fact that you are, you have the last word here in this section of today's program. Thank you, Fran. Well, I leaned over to her a minute ago and I said, I'm gonna try to make this three minutes. Um, I, uh, I uh, am really eager to get to lunch and get to talking, not so that I can listen rather than talk, but to tell you a little bit about ITEGA and uh, the most important thing to know is that I was driving up here last night from Williamstown, Massachusetts, where I live, and I said, why don't I use the recorder I've got to record my comments? And by the time I got to Bill and Kate's house, I figured it was 14 minutes long. So what I did is I loaded it up, I typed it up last night, and if you go to itega.org slash Vermont, you can read it. Uh, and that's why I don't have to talk for more than three minutes. It's itega.org slash Vermont. Our, uh, ITEGA is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, set up, that stands for the Information Trust Exchange Governing Association, with a three-part mission. One is to try to uh, help, it, help make it easier for people to manage their identity and privacy on the web. The second is to help uh, news organizations to develop a, a stronger relationship with their users. And the technology that we think is needed to enable those kinds of things will also create, ideally, a solution for a fast pass for news and for syndication on the web so that you can have one account, one ID, one password, maybe from any one of uh, the plural plurality of your news organizations and have that give you access to bundled content from elsewhere, sort of the cable model for news on the web. Um, so in the itega.org slash Vermont uh, discourse, I, I, I talk about these theories of change and action uh, one is that privacy, personalization, and payments are really critical to sustaining journalism. Privacy, because it goes hand in hand with identity, and right now, Google and Facebook pretty much control the way identity works on the web, and we need to change that. Um, and, and our thought is that we change it by having a nonprofit that makes the rules that govern how identity and privacy work on the web. So without identity, uh, personalization isn't possible. Without personalization, there's really no business model left for journalism. Um, that uh, one, so one, there's a set of actions that are possible around that. One is the idea of the special purpose foundation, which Angelo talked about earlier, and which I'm super interested in and want to sit in on that and listen on to that conversation. The second is to deal with uh, some way of creating a clearinghouse for the for the uh, IP transfer the, the copyright protection of content. Um, another action is to figure out a way to do aggregated payments. And if you read the, the thing I posted, it talks about how Eric Schmidt tossed, talked about that 10 years ago when he was head of Google. Uh, another action item is to keep thinking about ownership and how we do ownership. I think ownership really matters, and I'm, I'd like to see more attention paid to the possibility that a cooperative form of ownership could work in the news business. But the fundamental premise of all of this, which we've talked, I've heard about all of us talking about this morning, is that we need to collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And one of the interesting ideas in collaboration, which you can also read about in, in my posting, is uh, an entity called uh, journalist.net or trust.txt. It's a technology that would, that would, that's explained that would allow you to post uh, a note on your website that of the organizations that are trusted organizations you would belong to, 
And those, in turn, those trusted organizations like NENPA or the Vermont, the Vermont Press Association uh, can post a similar notice on your website, on their website, and by, uh, by then advertisers and uh, consumers can look for those texts, those text messages, and see that you're a trusted organization. That I don't explain it well. It's explained better in the write-up. But let's all have lunch. Thank you so much, Bill. Now, don't move. I've got a, this is going to be the most chaotic and um, part of the day, but it's going to work really well. What we want to do now uh, is... Fran, Fran, just one sec. There's just a yes. couple other people in this room. I'd love to have them just jump up and say a word or two. Um, okay. Roger Carity, who many may know, is the news director at Channel 3, yes. among other things. Great. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. I know everybody's hungry, so I won't be too long. Uh, in some ways, listening this morning, uh, I feel like a little bit of an outlier here. We're uh, a, a statewide organization. Uh, we're still founded uh, pretty much the way we were uh, originally. We're uh, a for-profit, uh, advertising-based uh, advertising -based, uh, entity. Uh, we have changed and adapted over the years as the media landscape has changed, and uh, we've tried to have uh, a reach in everywhere that we need to be to remain uh, viable and competitive. Um, and it's been really interesting to hear the different models talked about today and how you're all working so hard to uh, stay relevant and to survive. And, uh, and I would say, uh, I would echo somebody else's comments earlier, I, I think it's really, uh, you're doing an amazing job. Vermont has a robust uh, local media uh, uh, infrastructure and um, serving your communities amazingly. As, as Ann said, as a statewide organization, we, uh, you know, we depend a lot on the work that you're doing. The, the close community contacts uh, help us find stories. And um, we are, though we're a statewide organization and we tell statewide stories, we also tell a lot of local stories. And that's uh, the fabric of Vermont is, is uh, told by local stories. So, um, uh, I, I applaud the work that's being done, and, and I think that uh, the efforts to remain uh, viable and keep those community sources. My, my first job was at a local newspaper, and uh, uh, that was a foundational um, uh, 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 opportunity for me to get where I am today. Uh, lastly, just on the collaboration thing, uh, I would say that um, we have this wonderful collaboration with Seven Days and Paula Routley, it's been, I think, very beneficial for both of us. And it's something that I've wanted to explore more with local media around the state. And so I'm gonna throw that out there today that if there are uh, outlets that are interested in uh, working with WCAX and to get uh, their stories out uh, to a broader community, uh, we're really interested in that. And I would welcome a, a phone call or an email uh, to talk about that. So that's my little pitch. Um, and that's it, thank you. Roger, it's been a pleasure to work with in so many ways. Dan Smith here, president of the Vermont Community Foundation. Dan. Thank you, Richard. Everybody hear me okay? It's nice to be in the room with a bunch of people. This is the first public event that I've done in a couple of years, I think. So it's good to see you all. Um, I'm Dan Smith, president and CEO of the Vermont Community Foundation. I, uh, my first job out of high school was in the news department of uh, WDEV in Radio Vermont and Waterbury. Anson Tebbets, who's the current secretary of agriculture, was my boss there. He also uh, bought me my first razor, which um, <laughs> is a you know, small point of history. But uh, you know, I, the, the I have a couple of observations, and I apologize. I'm going to have to duck out. I got two sick kids at home, and uh, we're doing a handoff at midday. Um, the observation and the thing that I would ask you first, uh, except a gratitude for the service you provide on behalf of building strong communities. I think you know you can't dis disaggregate uh, the work of your organizations and your businesses from the strength and vitality of your communities. Uh, so thank you. Um, the second point I, 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 I've been thinking about this morning is that you can't separate out the experience of your enterprises from the economic and social experience of those communities. Which is to say, you know, when Angelo talked about the revenue streams that need to be revitalized, you're talking about the purchasing power of local purchasers buying subscriptions. You have to think about the economic experience of those local purchases. And right now, rural communities, not just in Vermont, which is entirely rural by almost every definition, 
but across the country, rural communities are in decline. So I hope you also um, think about how broadly we can revitalize the economic and social experience of rural communities, because rebuilding those communities will actually drive to greater vitality for your enterprises. But advertising revenue is the other example, right? When sm small businesses focused on place are going out of business and dealing with negative economic trends, um, you're gonna have less revenue. And so you need philanthropy not just to be thinking about how to solve this problem for these enterprises in the room, although that's the conversation we're having. You need a lot of people thinking about how to revitalize small towns across this country for a lot of good reasons. And that will be a driving factor in the vitality of your businesses. The, thir the third is, as you think about the work this afternoon and the exploration, don't limit your consideration to the idea of philanthropy and funding as a form of grants, right? Foundation philanthropy is a pool of managed assets that are invested, right? Across the investment world, people are thinking about the impact of their investments. And that needs to go beyond just the traditional and I think relatively narrow focus on what's labeled ESG, but actually be considering uh, the lens of place. That's the thing that we've adopted at the Vermont Community Foundation, which is thinking about what is the role of our invested assets to be active in place to drive healthy communities, not just invested over here to generate grant making over here that does a little bit of work to offset what may be incredibly challenging global and economic trends. Now, it's not easy for institutional investors to do, and I would expand your thinking beyond just foundation philanthropy and institutional investors. It's not easy for them to do because there are a lot of structures that define those decision making. But I, I think it's okay to put some pressure on institutional investors to think about how to put their assets to work in communities. One of the lessons of the pandemic is that distribution, disaggregation can actually be more stable, both from an investment standpoint, from a food system standpoint, a whole host of things. Concentration is riskier. Disaggregation and distribution may be stronger in the long term. So put some pressure on the folks who's either private foundations that are out there, uh, uh, endowments that are managed, you know, around, you know, to think about what their investments might do to build strong communities, to change some of the economic trajectories that have driven the experience of our communities and by extension, your businesses and your enterprises for the last 15 years. And I think that is a really robust conversation I hope you explore. Um, and, uh, you know, I look forward to hearing the product of the conversations this afternoon and the ongoing dialogue with all of you. Uh, and thanks again for your commitment to communities. Dan, we, we, could you? Yeah, so Ben Hewitt, just uh, the well-known Northeast Kingdom writer, speaking of rural. Ben. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, I promised Richard I would take 30 seconds, so I'm gonna speak really quickly. Um, I want to just address head on a subject that I think a topic that we've kind of been flirting with here. I really appreciated Roger's comments that really brought it to mind. Um, and I will preface this just by saying I'm listed on the attendee list as a journalist. Uh, Richard and Corey think I'm a journalist. That's one of the reasons they brought me uh, into the CNS. But the truth is I'm actually a storyteller, much more than a journalist and consider myself a storyteller much more than a journalist. And so I just want to put in a quick plug for storytelling as an essential service in our communities. Um, I think it gets directly to Meg's point about the, the, you know, the, the antidote to partisanship, I believe, is local storytelling. It's not just local news. Local news is critical, of course, but let's not forget about local storytelling. Um, I was thinking, reflecting a little bit ago on the thing that made me feel loneliest in the pandemic honestly was the lack of ability to go to uh, Willie's store in Greensboro and just talk to people and tell stories. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there. I want us not to forget uh, about the incalculable value of storytelling. We're losing the places where we are able to gather, not just with the pandemic, but to the erosion of the rural communities that Dan just mentioned. Um, we're really, really rapidly losing the places where we can gather and keep those stories alive. And to me, that's one of the things that just makes you know, living in my community and living where I do so valuable. And also, oh, I was also thinking this in context of your comments, Sarah, you know, how do we get people to see themselves reflected in our news? And I think one of the ways we do that is through storytelling. Thank you. That's all I want to say.
Can you make sure that mic's off? Wendy, Vermont Association of Broadcasters. Wendy. Hi, very, very quickly, because I know we're all starving. I just wanted to bring to everybody's attention that there is another, well, first of all, the Vermont Association of Broadcasters, our job is to unite and advocate for all of the uh, radio and television uh, uh, broadcasters here uh, operating in the state of Vermont, but um, I am not a journalist. Um, a lot of my time is spent uh, advocating for journalists and broadcasters. Um, I wanted to just bring to your attention that there is another piece of legislation that is uh, circulating through um, Congress right now. It's called the Journal Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. Um, basically what this would do is enable um, media outlets to um, collectively negotiate for with big tech to use the content online. So I encourage you to look, if you're curious about it, you can go to nab.org, um, National Association of Broadcasters.org, but this does include all um, media outlets. So look at it, it's called the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act and um, some of our, as I just came back from a trip to Washington where I spoke about this to Congressman Welch and to Senator Leahy, they felt that um, they were nervous that that would not actually help p uh, small uh, news producers here in Vermont. So if you feel that it, should that it would help you, certainly please look at it and then just let your representatives know. have a second one as well. Okay, Aaron. Hello. Hello. And tell us what you have been talking about, your recruitment, and uh, what you come up with. Thank you. Yes, we've been talking about um, recruitment and, um, you know, just some challenges around that and different, you know, levels of the organization. Um, I think one that we all agreed on right out the gate was um, pay. Uh, reporters <laughs> like to get paid for their work. Um, a living wage is always nice. Um, you know, retention, that helps towards retention. Um, you know, working deliberately with younger journalists as far as training goes. Um, you know, providing some sort of incentive as far as equity in an organization. Um, you know, journal, you know, newsrooms with more than five journalists sometimes have unions now. Um, you know, people like that, um, the journalists like that anyway. Um, let's see, uh, recruitment challenges, there's a, a drop off in, in applicants at a certain point. Um, you know, there's this sort of focus on, you know, as journalists gain experiences, they want to move, uh, onto larger markets, you know, and, and bigger newsrooms and stuff like that. So I think we talked a little bit about um, you know, trying to provide clearer paths towards growth within an organization. Um, you know, in general, I think across the board, that was something that sounded good. Um, you know, investing in staff, uh, having a strong newsroom culture. Um, you know, at this table, we had both myself and Avalon, we both work for the Vermont Community Newspaper Group. We're a pretty small, um, close-knit kind of community of, of people. You know, at, you can't have a newsroom as small as ours and have there be basically any tension at all, I think. Um, but, yeah, in, um, and Avalon talked about how she also um, enjoyed um, the kind of nurturing experiences she had at the beginning of her career um, I think anybody who is still working as a journalist when they get into their late 20s, early 30s, you know, has had at least some positive experiences in a newsroom. Um, and that has, you know, gone with, you know, editors fostering collaborative relationships within the newsroom, um, you know, taking people who want to learn and listening to their what they're interested in and, and helping them grow. Um, in their career um, and, you know, making uh, training available in the community. Um, obviously, Corey has done a lot of work towards that. Um, you know, he's obviously bringing up the, the next generation of journalists and, you know, helping them gain experience. 
Um, but yeah, you know, we talked about, you know, trying to keep reporters around and offering all these different incentives to them because preserving institutional knowledge is um, really important, especially, you know, if you are bringing on younger journalists at the same time, like in our newsroom, we have Tommy who, you know, has, has a lot of institutional knowledge about our area and that's really helpful when, you know, we're looking into different things like that and, um, you know, uh, what else do we talk about, guys? Well, you're, we're trying to keep this to two minutes. I know it's okay. crazy, well, that, but it yeah, sounds that's like much pay, pay people, um, yeah. mentorship is very important. Yeah. Training is very important. And I think what Corey's doing of training just community members, not necessarily, uh, s um, you know, UVM students right. also. Um, anything else major missing? One of our big challenges was how do we get to the point where we can make our sales pitch to the candidates we want to talk to because you know, a lot of times we don't get that they get to that point. You know, the, the, we're in a competitive market. You know, the top top candidates have multiple options, and uh, trying to draw top talent from outside this mm. area, especially, can be a real big challenge. Great. So that whole real re recruitment yeah, yeah. piece. Not as easy as one would think. Thank you so much. So we're going to try to go through these, and then you know, hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time for open discussion. But we've we've got a lot of great groups. Table number two. Can you here? I can give them the. Oh, they've got one. Um, yeah. So we were the collaboration table, and um, we're all really good friends right now. We're all going to go out for beers, and we started as enemies, <laughs> um, but we. We all we all got we were really doing well when the time ran out. So I think uh, if we'd had another minute or two, it would have been great. But uh, um, I think we spent a lot of the uh, of the time actually listening to our uh, our friend from New Hampshire, New Hampshire, um, and uh, a lot of the the things boiled down to um, with with collaboration, starting small uh, and starting out of necessity. Uh, uh, the, the, what really uh, made the thing hum in New Hampshire was the pandemic, and and they had a kind of a unifying goal uh, where everybody's kind of rowing in the same direction. So, um, if we're all living through the same sort of set of shared circumstances, that's an, that's a that's a common ground that everybody can kind of uh, uh, get on board with. Um, we have a we have a, a, a TV uh, representative at the table too, and so there was talk about you know. Uh, with those of us in the print world, oftentimes we sit through uh, hours and hours of select board meetings or zoning board meetings and, 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 you know, get as much drama out of the ink that we can put on that. But there's no visual aspect. There's no audio aspect. And, uh, you know, like their photographer can come in and take some great photos of the Girl Scout cookies or the person putting the ballot into the ballot counter or something like that for a town meeting uh, story. But to really, you know, to really capture the the... The, the the emotions and stuff like that that would be a good a good like kind of jumping off part for print and uh, and um, and uh, and TV to collaborate on. Uh, we also uh, talked a little bit about um, how uh, WDEV Radio Vermont Group, for instance, in our, in our case, I go on the radio with them twice a week and talk over the headlines. And uh, VPR does similar things on on Sundays and Saturdays or Sundays. I can't remember when, but um, so there's there's a a way of collaboration is sometimes uh, not necessarily collaborating on a story, but uh, interviewing like a like a more of a visual or audio centric media mom medium <laughs> I could say interview uh, a print reporter who's been sitting through a, you know onerous meetings and stuff like that and kind of getting their um, their take on things and and that and that helps the you know the print outlet get it, get to a bigger audience, but it also allows uh, the, the, the TV and the radio audience to get a little bit into the community, as, as Aaron mentioned, like those of us with institutional knowledge of our communities um, so that uh, the, a, a greater audience, and, and, and Rob was talking about you know, a particular instance where if, you don't, if you're not from the community, you don't know who to talk to. You know, if you're a radio or TV station, you go and you talk to two people, they may be the exactly wrong two people to talk to. <laughs> uh, they may have opposite views, but they may be the wrong two people to talk to. And um, 
um, and wrap it up if you had any yeah, think, next steps uh, or anything else I missed from this table. Okay. Oh, and projects, yes, uh, like kind of a delegation. You know, uh, when when you why if you're if you find yourself stretched thin for uh, resources uh, within your single organization, you might find that you have a lot more resources if you spread it out amongst different uh, organizations. And if you kind of swallow your ego and you know just all become parts of the of the of the of the machine rowing in the same direction, um, you'll find. Once you see it, the, the 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 fruits of your labor just once, just the first <laughs> time, it, it, it gives you kind of a, like, yeah, I could do this, I could do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Um, and table number four. Okay. Can everyone hear yep. me? All right, I'm gonna go over here so I don't have my back to everyone. Okay, so at table number four, we were talking about content, and there's going to be a lot of overlap over here with you all. I swear we were not copying off your paper, but um, thank you, that's helpful. Yeah. This doesn't count against my two minutes, right? <laughs> all right. Um, so we were talking about again about content, and one of the things we found, um, some of the things we found that were working well was that as local reporters, we know our local communities and we know what our local people want. Um, those can be things like seeing their kid's name in the paper, local sports, local schools. Um, one of the things that Bridget mentioned is that property transfers are actually really exciting in St. Albans, and apparently elsewhere as well. I'm seeing a lot of nods. Um, and then uh, I think Bill had mentioned as well that um, the uh, the police blotter can be really um, really popular <laughs> in some of the local papers. Uh, in terms of needs, pay came up several times. I don't think that's surprising. People want to be able to have a decent life, so they need a decent salary. One of the things that we talked about that kind of bled over between the two categories was that Vermont has a lot of writers. And um, Bill was mentioning, I think, that we have more writers per capita than any other state. Was that what you said? Yeah. Um, so we were saying, well, what we need to do is bring in some of this talent, <laughs> bring it on board. These, these are people who could be writing for us. And another way to bring in more writers and really engage with our readers is to have regular com uh, columns, especially uh, humor columns, can be really popular. And that can be something that can keep our readers and even bring in subscribers as well. There are people who will read paper just for that one column that they enjoy every week. We also talked about needing to, um, and this again goes back to what you all have in New Hampshire. I'm not going to try to do the accent. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the collaboration that you all have there to try to leverage the resources that are available to report, especially data stories, which can be really challenging um, and require a lot more in-depth work and a specific skill set that not every single paper has someone who has that skill set on staff. So in terms of next steps, uh, we we were talking about editors maybe reaching out to some of those local writers, trying to get in touch with some of that local talent and bring in more people. Um, again, leveraging resources, maybe using database resources at larger publications to feed stories to um, more local papers who might not be able to access or spend time digging through large databases to find their local stories. Uh, again, going in with local writers is finding new and different voices from your community to bring in to keep your community engaged. Um, and then another resource to bring in would be um, Front Porch Forum. There are um, someone in our at our table, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who, said that there are, uh, I think it was Scooter, said there are a lot of people who will speak up on Front Porch Forum, but might not write a letter to the editor or otherwise contact the paper. So inter uh, interacting more with people on um, Front Porch Forum to bring in, again, more voices, more stories, more perspectives. And we got to priorities a bit late, but um, we were saying one, uh, one priority, of course, for our local papers here is to get the content up on the website because, of course, many of our smaller local papers are only publishing once a week, a couple times a week, every other week, something like that. But um, you can also essentially be a daily if you're getting your content up more frequently. And I, I think... I, okay, content number two. Okay, so... Um uh, I'm going to permit myself the uh, the sort of ego to speak as the greenest of greens in journalism to say what the crisis of journalism is, 
which is for me, I think the crisis of journalism is an excess of information. There's so many routes for information to travel. There's so many places where we get information and we lose what's actually important in the sort of flood. Um, and so a lot of what we were talking about at our content table was how do we um, mitigate the, um, the damage that this kind of flood does. Um, and one thing that we sort of touched on um, about this flood is that public discussion, you know, through things like Front Porch Forum and Facebook are, you know, supported by, are supported by these many mediums. But what journalism is sort of trying to do and what journalism is um, consequently through this flood is sort of like having trouble doing is providing in-depth engagement rather than just discussion. People can talk and talk and there needs to be some place where somebody can just sort of define and, and explore something. And so um, we sort of wondered like what mediums will um, will actually allow people to like have this perspective because people are, you know, print is dying, um, people are sort of uh, going towards um, more social media engagement. Um, and as these mediums expand, the sort of attention diminishes um, the ability to sort of engage with these topics. So um, we talked about avenues of ad access that have worked for, um, for bringing journalism to people that wouldn't usually be engaged with it. One such avenue would be podcasting. Um, podcasts have become more popular with sort of people of like my generation, millennials and stuff. Um, and not a lot of people that I know listen to news podcasts, but um, podcasts are sort of this like audio mediums um, reach people more directly. Um, people stream a lot and there's a, there's, a, um, there's a priority on the accessibility of content now where one wants to take something and have it at whatever time they want. They want to go back and you know look something over again. The podcast can sort of give somebody a um, um, sort of direct access to headlines or direct access to um, things that they wouldn't usually notice. One particular idea for a podcast that we had uh, to move on to implementation kind of briefly because I, I think I'm going to run out of time before I have anything to say. <laughs> um, uh, one aspect of implementation that we talked about was having a uh, statewide media podcast. Um, so sort of like bringing in different, um, bringing in different uh, publications and people, uh, reporters from publications to talk about, you know, maybe stories that that publication did possibly bringing in uh, perspectives of the public, you know, turning, turning these stories into very like uh, long form engagements with issues, maybe even connecting said issues to sort of larger, like l larger perspectives. Um, and because really what the medium of journalism needs right now and what other mediums are missing is that kind of long form engagement, that really deep engagement with these things, you know, um, which, so that was one idea that we had for podcast implementation. And we'll need to wrap it up a little bit. Sorry about this. I'm, I'm like the person that everybody hates. But also know that any of your notes, please send them to Richard because we're going to compile all of these things. So if there's anything that's missing also, we will capture it that way. But go ahead and, and finish. Pardon me for, for interrupting. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. What else do I have to say? Oh yeah, uh, reader surveys. Um, one thing that we talked about uh, as far as implementation goes is um, providing surveys through email lists to readers of local publications so that we know what sort of things that they want to hear about and what sort of things are important to them. Um, bringing in public voices also was another thing that we sort of touched on, like front, uh, voices from Front Porch Forum, maybe trying to like get in touch with people from Front Porch Forum to ask them to expand upon things that they've talked about in those discussions. Um, because r really there's this like, there's this fundamental disconnect um, in the medium of journalism that um, needs to be bridged one way or another and it's kind of difficult to find that way. Um, I have nothing else to say really. I'm just gonna wrap it up. Awesome, thank you so much. Fantastic, and, and again, I, I know that this feels just, we're just rushing through this, but this is, these are all just we're getting together for the first time in five or six years. I think this is fantastic. Um, table number six. And I can move some of that. I, I think you can put that, yeah, wherever you, wherever you want it.
Meg, thank you. Thank you. Our group was talking about sustainability, balancing the digital and print media. Um, first, we talked about what's working well with each. I should take this off, sorry. Um, paper, of course, satisfies traditional readers. It attracts eyeballs on newsstands. Um, we thought of, of course, seven days as the classic example. You see it, you want to pick it up. It's graphical. The digital platform, of course, attracts a younger audience. It's got dynamic content. It's great for breaking news. And you can put up timely posts. Vermont Digger, classic example there. Um, of course, you can also have targeted ads on digital. And um, with digital media, there's no paper or printing costs. So a little better for the environment. What's needed? Um, of course, you'd have to build a, lo a loyal base on either platform with great quality reporting. All of us are competing for brain cells in a soundbite culture. So whatever platform you choose, or if you're doing both, like I am, um, you have to somehow attract readers and keep them there. You need to strike a balance of coverage for different users and different readers. And we found on my newspaper, as you probably with yours, you draw them in with a picture of the dog, and you hope they stay to, you, they stay to read about the school board meeting or the select board meeting. Next steps, of course, um, everybody wants to break even or make a profit. Um, we would, of course, love to get revenues for publishing public notices in our digital media. But that, we're not there yet. Um, and of course, as we've talked about all day long, having some tax breaks for our subscribers or our donors would be terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. And um, the uh, themes keep emerging here. Uh, table number seven, talking about leveraging digital trends and technology. Oh, thank you, Corey. Well, we, I'm speaking for the dinosaurs among us that uh, the, our readership at the Commons is mostly print and our internet presence is an afterthought. So in making a transition between print and digital, all the talk about collaboration today, a big thing ought to be collaboration in technology and training and ability for some of us dinosaurs who are lagging in our digital efforts to try and get up the speed. So we have a readership that really demands a printed paper. So we have to balance the printed paper that everyone wants with the future of having an internet presence that people are going to, the next generation or two of readers are going to have. And the collaboration of tech and training among us all might be helpful there to help some of us laggards catch up to other ones. And also teaming up with, uh, in the collaboration end of technology, going with the people who are already doing it right, like our local community access television uh, providers. We've done that in Brattleboro. Others may consider that too for helping expand um, reporting and also um, using Front Porch Forum to help promote our stories in one way or another. Obstacles for us, especially in the, in the southern part of the state, is our internet sucks. We have many people in our coverage area that can't get adequate broadband. So all the whiz-bang stuff you can do online is going to be useless if you can't access it. So uh, a little bit of, of uh, poking and prodding with the uh, Scott administration and the ledge to set, give us more money for broadband is going to be very important. Also, um, using our interns population to help uh, do some of these digital project, prod, uh, projects. Since they are more digital natives, well, you know, I'm still the generation that learned on typewriters. You got to help us old timers get up to speed <laughs> if we want to, if everybody wants to survive. And um, the collaboration with local schools too, we wanted to try and get, get uh, you know, the, the CNS pr project is great. We need something for Southern Vermont. Anybody got any ideas? Send them my way. <laughs> But tech collaboration, that's the one thing we came up with. We've got to get together on that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
And now we are table number eight. Go for it. You want to come right here or you can go on up? Okay, so we were sustainability funding looking at um, community supported journalism, membership, subscription, and ad revenue. Um, so it's, it's funny, everyone's, so far as almost everyone's mentioned Front Porch Forum, <clears throat> we had two members of Front Porch Forum at our table with this discussion. So uh, we kind of cut, we kind of cut out the middleman, just went right to Front Porch Forum. Um, but one of the things that we talked about what's working well is innovation. And Lisa from the roundabout here too, like thinking about ways in which being innovative about how you're both creating content, sharing content, and engaging with your community through different spaces. So the collaboration with the Times Argus has been really, has done really well for you, right? So, and then the partnership with VT Digger in terms of finding a fiscal sponsor to kind of move that. We talked a little bit about that, that kind of innovation. And also, which also leads to that kind of collaboration, which I think also people have talked about, which we also said was also something that was needed more and most, is that kind of smart collaboration between each other, right? Sort of what Grand Estate was talking about as well. Um, but the other thing that's working well too, is if you think about it, is like, is the connection that you all have with your communities. I mean, this is one thing like they know you and trust you already in many ways. So that is something that is actually working. And in this day and age, when, you, when you're when you seeing community news sites go down repeatedly and over time, um, and dramatically in some cases, that, that that's something that can't be gotten back. I mean, I think that was, I can't remember, was it? It was Angela, I mean, who said that, right? It's like, it's much, it's much, you know, it's much harder to build something back after it's gone than to try to do what you can to sort of save. And that innovation does come out of that, like doing everything you can to survive. Kind of like what Seven Days has been doing over the past couple of years, as everybody else has been too, like finding every little bit of place to kind of diversify your revenue. So that's the kind of stuff that is working. Um, one of the things that's needed most though is to try to figure out, especially for some smaller publishers or those who are moving from print to digital, is how to monetize some of that content on digital, whether it's through whether it's through email newsletters and ads there, or ads on, on sites entirely, and having more input from like, what do you charge, how often, what are the technology platforms to be used? So I think there's more to be done in that space, and it could be a, another group meeting here with some of the people who aren't in this room, which are on the business side, not just the reporters, um, who probably aren't thinking about ad rates and subscription costs or membership costs. Um, so the next steps we thought like we're was trying to sort of with the, maybe this group can have some examples they could share, especially or, or that members like Lisa or others who are just getting going could find resources to find where some of that is to sort of come up with some cost rates or think about some low bar strategies to sort of take smaller bites of the apple rather than trying to swallow the whole apple at once. And then also trying to figure out if there's a way, one idea came up here was like, is there somebody in the business school here who could partner with CNS to kind of maybe get some interns that work on that side? I mean, I know Champaign College does some of this. They'll do like these, they'll do like, like, a, biz, like a business development analysis of a nonprofit or other organizations, they'll sort of do it as like a case study for a class. Um, but maybe there's somebody here in the business school that could help train interns to come in and help do ad sales or develop business strategies that could sort of take the load off a little bit. Because we all know that you're already editing stories until 10, 11 o'clock at night. Like thinking about that stuff can be hard. So maybe there's other ways that could be supported. Um, and I will also say just sort of like from my work, but also hearing the content part, the kind of in-depth engagement that you're already doing, like that kind of reader engagement, those surveys are opportunities to be kind of be developing those kind of habits to kind of keep people, keep people coming back to you and engaging with you and trusting you. And then apparently, and, and then, then posting your stuff to Front Porch Forum apparently is whatever it says. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys very much. And on to the policy duo, policy dynamic duo back here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we, um, we had to talk about, let me read it, government funding sources, policy changes, tax credits, town budget, support, and grants. And we started off with uh, what's working well, and my partner here, Wendy, said, said not much. <laughs> but um, the reality is we heard some um, ideas today. Um, uh, new funding source alternatives are being considered, uh, tax credits and such, and those are good things. And hopefully they will work well. What's needed most? Liability for social media platforms. Or consider the internet to be a public ownership like broadcast airwaves are and regulate them as such. So that goes to what I spoke about earlier. 
this uh, idea of a lack of liability for social media companies is enabled by the Section 230 of Title 47 federal FCC rules. Next steps. Journalists and broadcast publishers need to lobby the US government to repeal Section 230, or at least modify it. Believe it or not, social media companies are doing that. They're lobbying to keep it. $700 million, my partner informed me, has been spent one year. Seven, that's what we're up against. So it's no wonder why that survives. Implementation priorities. Education on the issues, of course, very, very important. Organize those lobbying efforts for journalistic endeavors. And probably very important, and it's starting to happen, I've seen it actually on, um, on some YouTube videos, teach in schools media literacy. So students are able to recognize fake news when they see it, and they understand the different flavors of it, and can actually treat it like what it is, gossip. Wendy, did you have anything else? I think we were pretty short. Thank you, Ken. That was perfect. And, and finally today, this, this large group that moved together to, uh, to make something happen. It's, Scott, a, super, go ahead. it's a super group. A um, super group. So uh, we wanted to, all of what you all have been saying today comes back in part to how do we make sure that there is the resources to have great, truly like local journalism. Um, and so one of the proposed solutions is creating a nonprofit that would support this local journalism. And uh, it, it, there was a discussion about what a daunting task it would be. But at the end of the day, one of the big questions was, can we even do this? Is this allowed? Because a lot of the local journalism being done right now is being done for, by for-profit entities, right? And can you have a nonprofit that gives money to a for-profit? Luckily, we have two lawyers here who are real experts in this field. We have Wally and we also have Brian who are kind enough to give us their insights. And so mostly we discuss whether you can do it. And the answer is, yeah, if you f basically follow the rules and there are rules to do this. Um, one of the ideas, oh, by the way, the idea that's being floated for a name is Friends of Vermont Journalism. So a little breaking news there. You heard it here first. Oh, like, this is off the record though, right? Um, okay. Awesome. Uh, the idea though is that the Friends would be a place where people would donate to. The Friends have control of the money, but the donor could say, I want my money to be spent on this type of project in this type of community, even at this newspaper if they wanted to. So that is one of the ways that you might be able to get nonprofit money into for-profit uh, journalism. The, the money that's spent, though, would have to be for specific things that help the community, right? It can't just be for, I'm going to pick on Angela. It can't be for Angela's, Angela's big party. You know, the, well, that might benefit the community. I need to think of something else. But, it, you know, it has to be for a civic purpose. But most of what we're talking about today, covering your local select board, that's a civic purpose, right? So it probably would qualify um, according to the folks we had at the table for that sort of thing. Um, and there are next steps to be taken um, in figuring out how to set it up, but also in figuring out uh, how to sustain it. Because uh, you know w there are other nonprofit journalism organizations in the state like, like UPR and Vermont PBS, also Digger. It, it's one thing to set up something, it's another thing to sustain it. So that would take time and energy and resources. That being said, there was a lot of enthusiasm for exploring this idea and seeing if it could help sustain truly local journalism. Awesome, thank you very much. And if there are things that people need to sign up for, I think you'll probably get that through um, Richard. Oh, Angela wants to say a last word. Sure. Uh, on this nonprofit, one of the things that we we're going to try to put together is a accessibility of, of need. So that would be a conversation with uh, newspapers across the state uh, to identify what your needs are, what your annual needs might be, uh, how, how dire are they. And when we do that, we'll put something together, send it out to everybody. Uh, be honest, because if you're not, you won't get help. <laughs> Uh, so please look for that. We'll try to get that done uh, this spring. Thank you.
Fantastic. Thank you all for the enormous amount of work that you've actually put into this. I hope you enjoyed the day, enjoyed seeing your colleagues, enjoyed wrestling with some of these ideas. I'm going to turn it over to Richard, and I hope also you want to do this again next year. Um, actually, uh, hands, next year. Should we do this every year? Okay, cool. That, that looks like a yes. Um, thank you so much. We will be compiling this. That's going to be Richard's job. Um, thank you so much. It's been a thrill to be and an honor to be in the room with you. Go ahead, Richard. One other person we need to just take a minute and thank is our amazing facilitator today who just did all this on her free time and her spare time. <laughs> As somebody said to Fran as they were going out, I know it's an interesting event if you're facilitating it. Um, <laughs> thanks again to Kate and Bill Schubert and to Cree Lintelak and UVM for giving us all the space. And um, thanks to people who helped us organize this, Meg and Corey and all the others. Um, yes, we are going to write a report. We're going to try and take all this and make some sense of it. And so please, I did put index cards on the tables. If there's some, um, we didn't do that kind of evaluation, what went well for you today or what didn't. If there's anything you want to just write down or email me, and if you'll just, everything you have paper-wise, you can drop in that cardboard box as you, and we'll try and make some sense of it. We will, thanks to CCTV. This will be taped and available that way, but we are also going to try and make some kind of report, come out with some kind of next steps, and welcome your you know, continued thoughts as we do that. Um, I think that's, and please, we do have, you're welcome you know, to stay around, enjoy the view, and chat with your new friends. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, thank you all for taking the whole day to do all this with us.